you can think about the, the politics, what's the political motivation, but you also have to think about what's the motivation of people on the ground? What is what, what are people facing, right? In order to be able to kill civilians, either Palestinian civilians, or in this case, Israeli civilians. You have accounts of Hamas militants phoning in, calling families saying, listen, we got through the gates, I was able to kidnap or kill these, these Israeli Jews. And the parents of these fighters, there's, there's some clips of, they're just devastated. They're saying, okay, well, come home. We don't know what's going on, but just come home. Hey guys, you are about to listen to a conversation with Austin Nuppy. Austin is a political science professor at Utah State University. He is an expert on the Middle East and Middle East relations. He has traveled extensively throughout the area as you will hear from him in this episode. And when the Israel Hamas war popped off a few months ago, I was taking in so much information on social media and it was overwhelming to try to sift through it through not only social media, but different articles, different sources, podcasts, just to get a grip on what was happening. And so I went online and I Googled experts in Israel-Palestine, experts in Middle East conflict, and lo and behold, I found Austin Nuppy. And he was able to explain the conflict to me in a way that felt real, and it felt, I don't wanna say unbiased, because everyone has some sort of bias when I speak I'm speaking through my own personal bias but it it felt fair we also spoke about Austin's upcoming book, Surviving the Islamic State, which goes into depth on how everyday civilians survive wartime violence. And this is something that's often overlooked whenever a conflict like Israel Hamas pops off, there's an immediate political divide, sides form, and then people are projecting the outcomes that they wanna see with the rhetoric that they're spreading and, and they're, you're not necessarily thinking about what are these civilians going through? What what are the everyday people going through when things like rocket blasts go off, when people are faced with, okay, do I, you know, an extremist group is knocking down doors, how do I make sure my family and myself survives? What are the things that people have to do in war, in the nitty gritty everyday reality of brutal, just extremely violent, horrific war, a, a, an environment like that, how do you survive? How the hell do you get out alive? I, I know you guys will gain a ton of value from this conversation, as did I, and I'm excited for you to listen to it. So without further ado, here is the deep diving, wide ranging conversation with Austin Nuppy. Austin Nuppy, thank you for joining me on the podcast. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Yeah, yeah. So so you mentioned something before we started recording, which I'm very curious to get into from your perspective. So I've mentioned on past episodes that I'm currently based in Panama and there are massive countrywide protests that popped off about three weeks ago. And the country's been kind of a shit show just getting around everything that you sort of expect with nationwide protests. And then you said that you know, that sounds par for the course for what you've experienced. So I'm curious, where have you been where you've seen these sorts of country stopping protests and, and, and demonstrations in your your travels and, and professional work? Sure. Yeah. So I, I've ex I've seen them in places like Beirut, Lebanon, where there's a labor protest that shuts down the capital. Uh, for a certain amount of time or places like Jerusalem, where um, especially in the old city where there are people visiting the three most holy sites for Christianity, Islam, and Judaism that happens. I think most interesting is the first time I was in Iraq, I flew into Iraqi Kurdistan, which is in the north, uh, to an international airport in Erbil, which is a regional capital. And so this was the first time I was there doing field work for the book I just wrote. And I had a colleague pick me up at the airport. You clear um, customs, you get a visa on arrival, and then you go through a couple different layers of security. And then we were in the car and he's going to drop me off at the hotel. And as we were leaving... There's a big, long line to exit the, the parking lot and all of a sudden stops and a bunch of guys are, are honking and yelling at each other. Guys get out of the car. Some guys are armed, some are not just screaming at each other. Yeah. And it was all over some uh, basic slide of who was able to go first through the, through the parking lot. But it's like your first time in country. You're like, okay, here it is. Like, yeah. Yeah, that's um, I, that's what I've noticed. I, I, I've noticed the desensitization to some of the things that would set my alarm bells off in New York. Yeah. Yeah. Even though New York has a ton of crime of its own, you you can definitely go out and you know 
find a, a a knife wound, someone, you know, mugging you if you want to. I, I, you know, you give me an hour, I could go find a spot in New York where that's probably going to happen to me. Yeah, but it's yeah, more yeah. hidden in a lot of parts of the city, more kind of more underground. Here, I was staying by the airport in Tokyman, which is just the the neighborhood outside of the, the, the international airport in Panama City. Sure. And... Sure. I'm walking to the grocery store and there's just a car of guys that are not, they don't look threatening, but they're just carrying rifles out the window. And I was like, if I saw this in Park Slope, Brooklyn, I'd like go duck and cover (laughs) behind a dumpster. But because I know I'm in an area that I wouldn't normally stay in because of the protest, the only reason I was staying in that neighborhood is because it was so close to the airport and I knew it wouldn't be roadblocked. And I was just like, yeah, this is, you know, this is this feels normal for this area. It doesn't feel that off. They're, and they weren't doing anything other than just carrying the rifles. Exactly, right? And the weird thing is that's actually a good sign. So like when I was in Uganda, like in Kampala, I was going to a grocery store and there's a teenage kid, maybe 15, 16, with an AK-47 outside the grocery store. And that was to prevent people from stealing goods or mugging groceries as they were, as they were leaving. Yeah. And so that's kind of disorienting that you realize it's actually a good sign that there's like extra security. I, you know, in my experience, I'm far more worried about police or military forces that stop you than average person on the street, especially at airports or checkpoints or that sort of thing where you're kind of feeling each other out and you, you have to figure out what extra toll or tax or fee to pay to yeah. get through customs or get a visa or that sort of thing. So, Yeah, the the, the tax, <laughs> the, the travel tax that just went into effect 30 minutes before you pulled up to the stop. Yeah. Um, yeah, I had a few of those in Egypt. What, what are... What are some of the experiences that you've had that have maybe gone sideways with cops or or military since you've been abroad? Yeah, so um, I I really love Lebanon. It's an amazing place. It's uh, I was last there in 2019, so it's been a few years, and I think since that time they've they, they've experienced some more instability. Uh, when I was there in the winter of 2019, I was going into the country. I was going to do some interviews, meeting some actually Iraqi colleagues. It was easier to meet them in Beirut than in Baghdad at that time because mm. of visa and security issues for both American citizens and for Iraqi citizens. And so I was going through security, um, was going through customs rather, have an American passport, the guy stops and I start in Arabic and he kind of looks at me and then I switch to modern standard Arabic, kind of the formal dialect to try to see if we could communicate. And he stops and he looks at me in English and says, well, where have you heard of Lebanon? I said, excuse me? He's like, well, where have you heard of Lebanon? I said, I guess in a history book, I think your country's pretty famous. Yeah. And he's like, well, you know, I'm going to have to take this passport and go talk to my colleague. I said, no, you're not. Like, I, you don't want, you know, when you turn over your passport, you don't want someone walking away with your passport. Yeah. Because that's it's um, like being in prison. So that, yeah. That, yeah. Especially when you haven't cleared customs yet, right? Yeah. Kind of in this in between space. So I finally figured out what the appropriate uh, visa on arrival fee was for me at that point. Mm. And then uh, met my driver outside and he said, that's, that's not uncommon. But, um, yeah, there's, it's mostly state security force. And Lebanon, you know, it's a place where the Beirut, there's lots of police and military checkpoints within the city, given the history of the civil war they had. Uh, and also when you leave provinces. So when you go to Beirut uh, to go into Mount Lebanon, which is where like uh, a lot of ethnic and religious minorities live, it's really pretty and mountainous. And you can see the famous cedars of Lebanon, right? Of, of, of beautiful yeah. lore. It's, it's a really beautiful place, but you go and there, there are Lebanese army checkpoints. And depending on who your driver is, uh, those checkpoints either go uh, more smoothly or less so, right? Mm. So it, it typically helps to have a colleague or a fixer or someone that knows how to navigate those can that can send a text message ahead of time, letting them know we're coming, uh, that sort of that sort of thing. Um, but there's always, you know, between that sort of stuff and like traffic accidents, that's what I'm far more worried about than petty crime or any of the stuff that you yeah. experience. I lived on the south side of Chicago for a few years, and I felt I felt safer in most places. Spar- <laughs> Places in the Middle East than yeah. <laughs> in Chicago, to be honest. Yeah. that With that, uh, the customs guy, that's also such a weird, weird question to ask. Yeah. <laughs> what, what, like, where where did you hear of Lebanon? The, the, you know, if it's like if I landed in JFK and someone's like, where'd you hear Canada? And I'm just like, I, yeah. I don't know. It's I, a fourth grade textbook. I don't know what you're expecting <laughs> me to, to say in this situation. Just and a lot of it, I, I, it seems awkward because, you know, that they want something, but they don't come out and say it directly. Where if it was yeah. more straightforward and they're just like, we'll let you go for 50 bucks. You'd just be like, all right, here you go. You know, when all these things are negotiation, right? That, yeah. That's like where the actual politics happens in these places. You know, scholars 
we write about great power politics and what happens in government meetings and in smoke filled rooms. But honestly, like the most interesting stuff for me is when I'm in the field are those sort of interactions because that's like the nitty gritty everyday politics and in, in living in places yeah. like that. Are are there sure. are there other things because bribes is is one of them thing things that have a certain connotation in the U.S. When people hear bribes, they think of like super dirty people, like extremely, uh, you know, like something very dark is happening. Someone's bribing, and and you travel a little bit, and you realize that people in other cultures don't think of bribes as in the same way. It's it's sort of the normal operating system there. Right. Are, are there other right. things along with bribes that you've learned are just complete 180s when you travel in terms of the 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 acceptance of what people are doing there, the, the way that they operate? Yeah, I mean, I think the largest thing for U.S. citizens, especially for my students that are at university, other undergrads, or grad students, working on projects is you realize you like leave North America or you at least leave U S Canada, Western Europe. And like most places in the world, the cops aren't your friends. It's so like yeah. Americans, we have this deference to law enforcement, which I think is healthy and it's healthy for our democracy, at least yeah. most of the time, though not always. Uh, but you get to other places and you realize like, well, that, like you shouldn't have inherent trust for the cops just because they have a badge on their shoulder that says they're like Iraqi local police. Right. So we did a survey in Baghdad at the end of the Islamic state occupation. We, I was working with a local firm and some colleagues there. Um, and we send survey teams out to go door to door. So you kind of develop this survey plan where you want to get a representative survey of the city. And you send teams of four or six people out. There's a supervisor and then the people that go enumerate the survey. They have iPads or whatever and yeah. record the survey responses. But depending on what neighborhood in, you're in, you need different permissions, right, from local police precincts. So, mm. um, which is all just institutionalized form of bribery, right, or just graft. Yeah. Um, and so we had we had two or three teams picked up for a few hours at a time. Um, they looked at the mm. survey instruments and what we were doing, that sort of stuff. And then you pay the requisite fees or permissions. And then you have this whole little binder, right, of officially stamped yeah. documents, which are just total crap, right? But they allow you to get into certain neighborhoods to talk to people. And, and that's the reality in most of these places. And I think it's not uncommon in the US. We just have it institutionalized within our bureaucracy, right? Yeah, the, um, the, it, it is true. We we have it, it it's sort of ingrained, but and at the same time, we have such a deep relationship with cops as these savior figures from a young age where they, they start yeah. coming into schools at second grade. And it's like, we're the ones you call when you need someone to come save you or you need someone to help, which there are a ton of great cops in the U.S. But then you start to project that onto other countries and, you know, other other cultures and they don't have that same relationship it's like if if something goes wrong the first person they're gonna call is their neighbor or, or a family member yeah. a friend not a police officer yeah and like i realized that a lot of these places police officers like the salaries aren't great you may or may not have a pension and so lots of people moonlight so mm. you can work as a cop during the day and in the evenings you provide your neighborhood watch either security in your neighborhood or for a local business or for a prominent member of your community yeah. So people's identity, you know, as a combatant or non-combatant or a cop or civilian shifts so much. And, you know, I used to, when I would explain this to my students, I used to reference The Wire. At this point, students don't really watch Sopranos or The Wire, but The Wire, yeah. you know, is the perfect example of kind of the politics of local security provision. Yeah, I need to watch the- like that. I, I was gonna, just going to say I need to watch The Wire because my older brother keeps recommending it. He's never missed yeah. with a show recommendation, so I definitely need to to check that out. It's a little bit of a generational thing, maybe, but that's what I tell my students that you want to understand like local, local politics. It, it's a, it's a pretty uh, yeah. layered show. Yeah. So, so I want to take a step back a little bit because you're yeah. a, you're a professor of political science at Utah state. You could have went a million different directions with political science, but you've chosen to focus on wartime violence and, and politics in the middle East and more specifically civilians surviving uh, the violence of war. Right. What what drew you towards that direction? What what was the the spark for you to to focus on wartime violence? Yeah, I think that's a good place to start. You know, for most of us, the the joke is that research is me search. So anytime yeah. you're doing a research <laughs> project, it's it's in part personal biography, right? And that's yeah. the same for I think for journalists or podcasters or or academics. You know, I, I was born in 1986, so the uh, the Al Qaeda attacks on 9 11 happened when I was in high school. I was 16 mm. in the San Francisco Bay Area, and that was a really seminal point of 
kind of a wake up call to the reality of international politics on the one hand and the effects of U.S. foreign policy on the other. On the other. So that's kind of where my, my initial interest started. Uh, went to school in the Midwest, did an MA, ended up doing a PhD between going to the University of Chicago and pursuing my doctorate. I thought about the U.S. Foreign Service, took mm-hmm. the test, uh, passed the written test, flushed out at the interview stage, as is pretty common for young professionals, at least, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, decided to do some more work. And as I was uh, working on my doctorate, I'd already... Um, was working on my Arabic language skills and was already engaged in Middle East politics. And then that is when that transition period for when the U.S. leaves Iraq the first time and ends up coming back because of ISIS. And so as I was trying to pick a book topic, dissertation topic was the rise of the Islamic State. Mm -hmm. Um, And and so started uh, researching that, um, surveys, interviews. And, you know, we're trained scholars, especially in political science, we're trained with a lot of quantitative methods and data, uh, data science skills, which I think is really valuable. Um, at the same time, doing field work and learning a foreign language, you realize that a lot of politics is local and it affects ordinary people's everyday experience. And so I had this kind of um, cognitive dissonance where I had this fancy set of methodological tools yeah. to answer these questions. And then when you go to the field and you talk to people, you're like, well, these tools are kind of limited. You need to combine ethnography and field work and foreign language with data science. And that's kind of how I, I stumbled into the Iraq project Yeah, uh, in the last six or seven years. So w- what age were you when 9-11 happened? I was 16. 16. So you're you're right in that timeline of the the patriotism call to action to yeah. to go into war, which yeah. which is interesting because a, a lot of people saw 9-11 happen and then that the direction they chose to go was to to immediately just go into the military and go fight. And right. you took an immense interest in the roots of this conflict in a different way. Were, yeah. were you, what were your thoughts? Just cause I was, I was second, I don't know, second grade. How old was I? Yeah. Seven, eight years old, somewhere around there. What were you, what do you remember thinking around the time as a 16 year old young adult, pretty much still a boy at that point when nine 11 yeah. happened and you see, I'm sure there were either friends or friends of friends you knew who were making all different types of decisions based off of recent events. How, how what was that like seeing that? Yeah, I, I think it was kind of disorienting. I tell my students this cause they're all born now. My current cohort of students are 2002, 2003. So they're even born. That's post wild. They're, they're learning yeah. about nine 11 from videos and textbooks. That's, that is wild. Yeah, they're learning about Osama bin Laden on TikTok, which is just, yeah, here. I saw that. I, uh, that, that is. So yeah, yeah, we'll get into that later. Yeah, but for anyway, sure. You know, I, um, so I, I was in the San Francisco Bay area in an upper middle-class suburb. Um, and so those attacks happened about six thirty in the morning when I was getting ready for school. So my mom had it on the television, uh, decided to send me to school. And that really shaped, I think a lot of us, that's that's about the age when you start looking at universities and trying to figure out what you want to do post post high school. In my high school, most people, well, you know, wanted to go to Berkeley or they wanted to go to the University of California system, and and they're all you know, strivers, right? Yeah. Um, and so some people did ROTC where they would pursue a military career in university. I had very few friends, if any, that enlisted right out of high school, and I think that was largely a function of geography, kind of on either coast. That was more the mm. experience of a lot of us than in the Midwest or in the South where the military is a viable career as soon as you graduate high school. And so I, I had this kind of bizarre experience in, in retrospect of during the 20 year war on terror, uh, the U S was at perpetual war in Iraq and Afghanistan, Somalia and elsewhere. And uh, my standard of living and career opportunities only got better. Yeah. So I, I've had uh, probably four or five friends, relatives serve some were downrange in Iraq or Afghanistan. Um, others were stateside as a, uh, military attorneys, the JAG program, stuff like that. And uh, just our exposure to the reality of that really, in a lot of ways, was divorced from reality, which I think is a long way in explaining how do we fight this war for 20 years plus and get to the point now, only two or three years ago, where we decide we need to redeploy and leave Afghanistan. Like what, what we weren't really exposed to the car. Many of us were not exposed to the costs of war, right? The blood and treasure that goes into fighting these wars was born on an incredibly small subset of the U.S. population, and then certainly civilians in places like Iraq and Afghanistan. Mm. Um, the average U.S., especially if you're upper middle class, if you have a university education, you're insulated from the costs of war by design. Mm. Right? We've developed a war fighting strategy in the last 20, 25 years that insulates the electorate from the costs of war. And that only in retrospect, I think, is really troubling 
politically, economically, and we've yet to really reconcile with that. Um, we've only been out, I guess, two or three years. I think it'll take some time yeah. before we come to terms with the legacy of that. Yeah, it, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense when you have the 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 class of people who's going to university that are eventually going to become politicians and decision makers leaders of the country that have to make decisions about something that they're never actually going to incur the cost of right. themselves. It's like it's like if someone asks you to take care of a house and, and do the upkeep and, you know, take care of the plumbing and all this stuff, but you have zero equity in the house. It's exactly. like, fuck, go fuck yourself. Like other, someone else will, I'll, if it burns down, I don't care. Someone else can, you know, step in. I'll just buy another house that you know, to replace that one. So yeah, it, it doesn't make sense. And then just about violence, you were saying where we're insulated from the the violence of it. it, I, it we're, we're insulated from the, the actual physical hand-to-hand combat. And then when the, we do see the violence, it just immediately becomes politicized. Like it goes through yeah. the, the funnel of media. And so it's like we people don't even focus on the violence. They just focus on how they're going to filter the violence to fit into their talking point. And then the actual bodies, like the names, the, the numbers are kind of just right. fodder for political talking points. I think that's absolutely right. You know, yesterday I was in the Times, Washington Post, there was a survey of how uh, the American electorate is perceiving of Joe Biden's um, policy in Israel and in, in Palestine right now. And it's just so polar. It's totally split, right? Where you have uh, you have a much larger cohort of self-identifying Democrats being supported by, and despite the fact that lots of progressive Democrats, especially millennial Gen Z, are actually drastically different than Biden on Israel policy. You see uh, um, two-thirds support, 65 70% support, strictly because it's the Democrat in the White House. Yeah. Republicans are the opposite, despite the fact that you know Republicans typically have a history of being uh, pro-Israel. Um, and so that's just when, between that and the rise of anti-Semitism on the far left and far right, it's just bizarre. And that's mostly, that, a lot of that's changed in the last 10 years. During the, the global war on terror, those dynamics were a bit different. But there was always a, um, a hesitancy to talk about collateral damage, right? Mm. Killing civilians. And, you know, um, I think American policymakers for a long time deceived themselves that using drones and special operations forces and all these other light footprint tactics could actually um, could spare civilian life. And in fact, it took the Times. I mean, New York Times just three, four years ago finally had a pretty um, – significant investigation to how many civilians were actually killed by the U.S. drone program. Yeah. Wasn't it like 80% were civilian casualties or, or something like that? Or like 80% of targets were not the intended target? I forget. The also, Khan, yeah. Yeah. There's a great, you can, you can look it up on the, 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 the team that wrote that one, a Pulitzer uh, for that investigation. Um, but the, the, the casualty estimates cited by the Pentagon and NATO compared to outside investigations by universities and think tanks and human rights organizations are just wildly disparate, right? So I think if you're following this stuff, even, even as a casual observer, you just have to be super skeptical of when official government organs come out with casualty estimates. Yeah. I, I mean, that's that's insane just on its face to be able to right. play Xbox and take out a wedding. Like the, the disconnect of the actual carnage on the ground versus you're seeing dots on a screen you're going like li- probably have something like an xbox controller in your hand and you're just like all right yeah. i guess this you know they told us these are the bad guys let's you know take these these people out it, it seems very surreal like I, i'm pretty i was about to say black yeah. mirror but i'm pretty sure they made a black mirror episode about that um but yeah it's it's crazy yeah, we're we're at, we're at the point where Black Mirror is uh, less strange in reality. It's the same reason yeah. why Veep had to go off the air. Like when politics gets more absurd than Veep, then you know. Yeah, Black Mirror is catching up. Black Mirror is catching up to reality. Uh, so, I I, I want to get into the the Israel Palestine conflict and a lot of that has to do with the civilian casualties that you were mentioning, sure. and. We spoke offline about what may be a good arc to get into it. And I know for myself, I knew more about, you know, Mets Yankees than I did Israel Palestine when this started, which is is not right. good on my part as a, you know, global citizen. And so I think it would be good to uh not, not just for myself, but for other people to to have a brief overview 
of the last hundred years, which sounds like a lot, but a lot of people are like going back thousands of years to try to explain what happened. And I've I've seen multiple interviews that you've done where you go, you know, hold up, this this is not a you don't have to go back three thousand years to understand this. This this is a about a century old conflict going back to nineteen eighteen. So I thought that would be a good place to start with the the British mandate in Palestine in nineteen eighteen after World War One. And so so what were the terms of the the nineteen eighteen British mandate and and what made it the genesis of the modern Israel Palestine conflict? Yeah, that's I think that's a good place to start. I you know, I tell my students here at Utah State and elsewhere that if you remember nothing else from my seminar on Middle East politics, you need to remember that the the war is a hundred years old, if not if not more recent even. So we'll, we'll get into that. But um, you know, primarily a war over territory, national identities, nationalism, the desire of people of a common ethnic or religious group to have a territory and their own political sovereignty is huge. That is related to religion, but not always central to it. We kind of forget that the, the early, a lot of the early Zionists in, in 19th century Europe, uh, 1860s, 70s, 80s, were secular and they were socialists, right? They were looking mm-hmm. around Europe and seeing all the political turbulence in places like in Germany and in Italy and the rise of Marxism in the European continent and saying, okay, if all these other uh, communities can self, um, self-identify self and, and claim sovereignty for themselves, what about the Jews? You know, the Jews, we've had a history of pogroms and ethnic violence perpetrated against us, especially in the Russian Empire and elsewhere in Germany after the Reformation. The only way that Jews can be safe is to have a land they call their own. We need a state. Mm. And so that Zionism, that, that political impulse is really a, in large part a product of the 19th century the rise of nationalism throughout the world, right? And so I, that, that's, a, that's a helpful place to start in order to understand Zionism in particular. World War I is huge in that because the uh, two of the, the Axis powers that end up losing the war are multi-ethnic empires. So the Ottoman Empire had been around 800 years plus, controlled large parts of the Middle East. And most people in Israel-Palestine, if you're an, an Arab-Palestinian before the war, you're used to having an, an, an Ottoman uh, um presence in your community, yeah. right? So you have Turks covering over you, you have lo- local Arab leaders and landowners, but the, the Turkish empire, the Ottomans are the main governing force in that area of the world for a long, long time. And then with the rise of, of, of imperialism, you have the British and French first in Egypt and later than in, in, in Israel, Palestine and the Levant getting involved. And yeah. so when, when World War I ends for the Middle East, it's the collapse of the Ottoman empire turns into the secular Republic of Turkey. There's a civil war. By 1923, the Turks have a secular republic. Okay, uh, By that time, the British and the French are losing colonial influence, and they're trying to figure out how do we actually administer these places that we have ended up occupying as a function of the war. So the Brits go into bed with local Arab uh, uh, leaders saying, listen, we're going to uh, form an alliance of convenience with you to defeat the Ottomans. So if you mm. mobilize local forces to fight the Ottomans, we're going to grant you self-determination. You're going to get your own state. Mm. And at the same time, the British and the French are speaking out of both sides of their mouth. So on the one hand, the Brits are cutting a deal with um, Sharif Hossein, this local political elite to say, you know, uh, you're going to have your own state in a place like uh, um, Mecca and Medina, the Saudi Peninsula. And jo- the kingdom of Jordan is going to be its own kingdom. And in, in the Levant and Palestine and, and Lebanon, mm. um, where at the same time in uh, Britain, you have uh, promises to prominent Jewish Zionists of support for a Jewish presence in the Middle East. This famous Balfour Declaration, November 1917, is one sentence. It's something like 67 words between the British Foreign Secretary and a prominent British Zionist saying, you know, the, the, the administration looks fondly on your desire for a homeland for the Jewish people. Mm. Right. So this is all happening in the middle of the war. The war ends. The British and the French end up winning. And under the auspice of uh, the League of Nations, they set up a, a mandate um, system where the French end up controlling Syria and Lebanon under the Syria mandate. Um, they get protectorates. So Yemen and parts of the Persian Gulf are British protectorates. The place now known as Israel-Palestine becomes a, 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 a British mandate, which is basically this creation of international law to justify colonialism. It's mm. saying that the, the European great powers are going to be custodians over these lands until the local Arab rulers and local Arab people are able to govern for themselves. Yeah. So it was it was imperialism under the guise of international law. Of course, that always nations, works out so well. <laughs> yeah. Yes, especially in the yeah. Middle East, right? Yeah. And so this is where you get the British presence, and the British are, by definition, at the very start, at the end of the war, all the way into World War II, are in this really thorny position where they're trying to figure out how do we 
uh, administer this land um, as a, as a mandate. Trying to we're basically colonial overlords. At the same time, we're trying to appease a, a local Jewish minority population, which grows over that time period, and the Arab and Palestinian population that had been there prior. And so they end up cutting deals. Um, there's a series of protests and labor strikes. We can talk all about that, but it. By by definition, at the end of the war, when they inherit this man, or create rather this mandate system, they're in an impossible position, and it's of their own making. Mm. So, the were the the Jews in Palestine were they considered extensions of the British? Did did the Arabs see them as sort of uh, like in cahoots with the British, even though the Arabs still outnumbered them at the end of World War One? So I, I think there's a number of perspectives there, right? Obviously, there's a Jewish presence in that area for a long, long time prior to World War One, yeah. prior to the Ottomans. Um, Jewish immigration from Europe into Palestine um, begins in earnest in the 1880s and then yeah. increases in the 20th century. And so you, it, it depends, right? The, the politics and, and demographics of Israel to this day are fascinating because you have about 40% of the country that have European ancestry. They're Ashkenazi Jews. Right. A lot of the early Zionists were from Poland and from Ukraine. Mm. And at the same time now, you have large populations of Mizrahi Jews from the Middle East and North Africa. And so for a long time, you had really vibrant Jewish communities in Tehran and Baghdad and Damascus and Morocco. And so um, you have a mix of both European Jews that are immigrating to Israel-Palestine in the beginning of the 20th century. And then you have Jews that have been in the Middle East for a long, long time. Mm. Um, and to this day, a lot of the political fault lines and disagreements you see in, in contemporary Israel break down to whether or not you have European ancestry or Middle Eastern ancestry. Okay. So after World War I, all this tension is building between the Arabs and the Zionists. The, the Brits are still in control of this region. And then for, from my understanding, the... The Peel Commission comes in, that's 1936, where the Br Brits are basically like, we can't do this shit anymore. This is getting out of control. And then uh, the Arab uprisings happen and, and World War II comes after that. And that's kind of like a pause on this whole problem. And, and feel free to, to jump in if, if you want to zoom in on anything. But is that, a, sure. is that fair to, to say, like a fair characterization of that timeline? I think in large part. So you have um, you have local Arab Palestinian communities uh, that have been there during the entire mandate period and preceding it. Part of the problem is, as you have immigration of Jews from Europe into Palestine, there are different disagree uh, different ideas about what it means to settle the area. There's the practical Zionist approach that we need to get there and farm and build communities, build schools. It's very much based on like this socialist ethos that we're going to build this community and that's going to legitimate our presence. They're going to see us building the community. Mm. And we're going to get along for the most part with local Arabs and Palestinians, um, Muslims. You know, there wasn't really the primary fault line there was not religious. It wasn't, oh, you have these Jews. People knew that Jews had a religious history there. It was a way of foreigners coming in. They're buying property that um, Palestinian Arabs were um, uh, renting to basically um, develop and farm. It wasn't quite sharecropping, but you had a series of really prominent landowners, some local Arabs, some Ottoman Turks that controlled large parts of the land. So mm -hmm. when you get uh, European Jews coming, uh, arriving in the interwar period between World War One and World War Two, they may have legitimate means to buy property, rent property, set up farms or communities. But you also have local communities there that had been been on the land; they were renting access to that land that feel displaced, mm. saying, "Listen, like we may not own this, but this is we've been here for a long, long time." You have people coming in, changing the demographics and, and local economy. Um, the Peel Commission, the Churchill White Paper. There's a series of these legal documents and political strategies. They can all basically be summarized to the Brits trying to figure out how do we limit European immigration to Israel-Palestine at the same time we address uh, local Arab uh, grievances. Mm. Um, and so you have a series of labor strikes, um, intercommunal violence between uh, uh, Jews and Arabs during that time. Um, and like I said, as a colonial overlord, you're basically in an impossible position, right? Yeah. Be, as During the start of the mandate, I think it's something like 6 or 8% of Palestine is Jewish. That increases over time uh, to World War One. You can there's plenty of um, charts online. Where you can just see the line chart increase yeah. over time. Um, and and by World War Two, then they uh, there's domestic unrest. But the British uh, go back to the playbook they had during World War One. They realize this is going to be a multinational conflict. We need to recruit soldiers from the empire 
to fight under the crown. So you have British presence in the Middle East. They have to recruit uh, Jews to fight in the Middle East against the Germans and Italians. And so you, they basically, the British Empire has to reconstitute its colonial army to fight the Axis powers. Mm. And that ends up having a lot of unintended consequences and ends up undermining the, the British Empire after World War II. The empire collapses and has very little influence in the Middle East after 1945. Similar story for the French in places like Lebanon, Syria, etc. Mm. So after World War II, is that when the decision of what to do with Israel Palestine, or just like the the Palestine area in general, is handed over to the UN. That that's with the whole partition plan in 1946 or 47, somewhere around there. Yeah. So in the first 18 months after the war, uh, you have the creation of the United Nations. It's a pretty mm. new institution. Yeah. Before oh wow, that, I had, didn't know that. So that that's a yeah, shit the UN, show. <laughs> yeah. The UN comes out of World War II, and it's an international organization designed to prevent the horrors of that war. Yeah. Right, so it's the great powers, the victorious great powers sitting down and saying, okay, how do we prevent uh, World War III? We've just fought yeah. two nasty, nasty And half the UN conflicts. is interns at that point because they've been around for a year. So they're just like, what yeah. are, <laughs> like how are we going to – we don't even know how to fix the fax machine, but we have to somehow fix uh, right. Palestine. Yeah, and, the, and the, you look at the Security Council, it's the same permanent five members we've had since World War II. And that's increasingly not working now that you have – powers that are excluded from that. The fact that you don't have German or Japanese presence at the Security Council, at least as permanent members, makes mm. sense, right? This yeah. is the end of World War II. You have Soviets, Americans, Chinese, Brits, French. Um, and so the uh, the Palestine issue um, is fascinating because it's the first real diplomatic test for the United Nations. They release um, a, a UN um, statute, I think it's 248, um, after World War II, um, trying to set up what are the different boundaries? How do we deal with uh, territorial disputes between these local populations. In order to do that, you realize that things that are really mon- mundane are actually quite important. You mm-hmm. need to figure out, you need to do a census, right? So you, you need to figure out how to collect taxes, who is where, what religious communities live in what communities, and just reveals the fact that do, doing something as boring as a census is actually like quite contentious. It's inherently political. Mm. And so the um, the United Nations develops a, a a, scheme, uh, a schematic basically for how to partition the land, it doesn't gain much traction because by 1947, 1948, you have um, local Zionists uh, that launch an insurgency against British rule and they declare uh, independence in May 1948. Mm. And so what happens to be, it, it starts as almost an anti-colonial uh, in, insurgency of local Zionists and, and also Arab communities against British rule. Uh, World War II ends. The British are on the winning side of that, but they're they're penniless, right? They're in a, a strong political position within the United Nations, but they're they don't have the political will, the military capability, or the economic power to maintain the empire. Mm. So they end up leaving the British uh, self determine unilaterally, right? They declare independence in the spring of 1948, and and that's when you get the birth of Israel. It's, it's a new country. Yeah, right? it has historic roots, certainly historic religious roots uh, in that area for a long, long time. But in terms of the state of Israel, it's a relatively new political creation. I think most of us forget that and never realize that these are all super recent events, at least in the span of history. We're not that far into it. Yeah. So Israel declares independence in May of 1948. And that is that when the they get attacked by a few Arab states in response to that? That's the war of 1948? How did that yeah, transpire? The, the, well, so there's um, – whenever you talk about this stuff, there's, of course, two different narratives. Yeah. And so whenever I try to teach it, I try to take a, take a breath and pause and conv- convey to you two, three, four different perspectives on those events. If you're uh, um, an Israeli Zionist, uh, you look back at 1948 as a declaration of independence, right? It's quite interesting. The Israelis don't have a constitution. They have a declaration of independence, um, but they have a basic law instead of a constitution. And in fact, it's mm. overwhelmingly secular. Right? The laws that establish the state of Israel don't really mention God. These are secular documents. Mm. And so you have, uh, um, uh, for Jewish Zionists, it's a celebration of a declaration of independence. The war of 1948 is a war of defense against Arab neighbors uh, to the north. Uh, you have uh, Jordanians, Egyptians, Syrians coming in to try to defeat this nascent state. Okay, That's the narrative uh, from the Israeli perspective. If you're, if you're a Palestinian or an, an, an Arab in neighboring states, This is the Nakba. Nakba is uh, Arabic for catastrophe, where during um, 
in the years leading up to including uh, the Declaration of Independence, you have something like 700,000 or 750,000 Arab Palestinian residents displaced from their homes mm. in Israel, Palestine, where they're, they, um, they're displaced and many can't return. 150,000? 700. Oh, 750,000. Wow. Oh, that is. Yes. I mean, 150,000 right. is bad. 750,000 is. No, it's, is it's wild. a massive displacement yeah. of the population. And so you can see, even in those seminal events, there's at least two or three different narratives. Is, is this, on the one hand, a declaration of independence and, and a chance for celebration and bravery? Or is this a catastrophe that our community is being displaced? Yeah. Um, and so you that there's a real historical trauma on both sides, but particularly for Palestinians rooted in 1948. And so when they see subsequent wars, so they see what's going on in Gaza, when the Israeli defense forces say, well, you can evacuate to the south or you can leave the Gaza Strip, that triggers um, not only current trauma, but it just historical memory of a, of a community of people with a concrete national identity being displaced. Yeah. Th- I just want to pause there for a second, because that, that's yeah. something that I've been it's realizing important. in my, you know, my s- surface level amateur review of what's going on today and then looking back into the past is that there's so many contradictory and and different narratives held by both sides and and both sides have a story where they perceive that the same events happen there's this objective unfolding of action and time that takes place and then as a human being you see that and experience that and then you create a story that's what humans do they have a story in their head of how it unfolded and then what transpired and and when you have a an intense group conflict that like you pointed out is not just about religion or religious extremism it's also land disputes it's also water it can be hard to take a step back and analyze and question your own narratives your own truths that have been held for so long and th- those exist on both sides but both sides can be i think it was uh yaval harari that said in almost every single ethnic conflict you are a victim and a perpetrator at the same time both sides mm-hmm. that there's there's no clean break of victim and perpetrator so that that's just something like as i dig deeper and deeper and i'm and i'm always trying to learn uh, I'm trying to learn more about how this can happen and, you know, implications for the future that these narratives, and I have my own stories about how things happen too, that it's important to to question those and, and really dig into them. That's absolutely right, right? I mean, scholars would call that collective memory, where we have a, a common set of facts and, and retelling of history that shapes our so- social identity, what we believe, how we behave, who we belong to. And so, you know, when I talk to my Israeli Israeli Jewish friends, especially I have a friend that's a, that's a rabbi and he says that, you know, uh, unlike Christianity or even Islam, Judaism is a community of people tied to a particular place. So whether or not we've been displaced, there's a promise of return and we're tied to a particular place for a particular people. And so the yeah, people convert into Judaism or marry into Jewish families, but it's a fundamentally different understanding of religion than for Christians or Muslims, right? For Muslims, um, places like Mecca and Medina are important. You do pilgrimage there as a faithful Muslim. Those are important holy places. For Christians, uh, you know, it may be meaningful to visit Jerusalem, but it's not necessary. You can be a Christian in Panama City, in Logan, Utah, oh, yeah. or in Jerusalem, <laughs> right? So the, um, that I think that kind of even complicates some of the religious narrative too, right? How people understand their own beliefs, belonging, and behavior. Yeah. That, um, the first time I saw a Christmas tree in Florida coming from New York, I was like, this is wild seeing christmas paraphernalia in 97 degree weather even just like the weather i was like people can be christian in hot weather this was blowing my mind yeah you can celebrate christmas in uh, (laughs) In, in in yeah yeah yeah, there's a good chance i'm (laughs) celebrating you know in a 102 degree weather in 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 panama but um but yeah that, that that's a good point so to to fast forward a little bit you have uh after the war of 1948 which is the nakba on the Pal- Palestinian side, and then the the independence from the Israeli side. Then you have the war of 1967, the the Six Day War, and that is, from my understanding, the war that set the modern borders that we know today with Israel, and then the Palestinian territories with with West Bank and and Gaza. Is that accurate to say? 
Yeah, so you have 48, which is certainly important. 1956, you have an yeah. Israeli incursion into the Suez Canal. And so there's a crisis involving the U.S. and the Soviet Union, the Egyptians and Israelis, where it's one of these weird uh, instances during the Cold War where the Soviets and Americans agree. Eisenhower and, and the Kremlin are on the same side that we need to stop this war. Uh, the British and the French are basically send military forces into Suez as the last gasp of kind of colonial power. The Israelis make it to the Suez Canal and the, and the great powers, the two superpowers, the Americans and the Soviets, need to, to diffuse that. And so it's important to, for a lot of this also to keep in mind the Cold War context and that these are local client states in the context of a much broader competition between the Americans and the Soviets. Mm. Um, 1967 is an, another seminal event. This is the beginning of, of, like we said, the modern borders. And so when you had during the Oslo process in the 90s and, and Ford debates over one state, two state, where you draw the lines, that was over pre or post-1967 borders. Got it. Before 67, um, you have the Green Line, the Armistice Line that comes out of the 48 War. After 67, you have this, uh, if you're an Israeli Jew, it is a miraculous preemptive victory within the course of six days in June 1967. The Israeli uh, de Israel Defense Forces once again repel Egyptian, Jordanian, Syrian forces coming into their country. Mm. They launch preemptive attacks and they defend their borders. Not only that, they expand their territory to include the West Bank, the Golan Heights on the Israeli-Syrian uh, border, and also the Sinai Peninsula. Mm. And so you have a massive expansion of Israeli territory because they won that war. Okay. And that and was that, where the so, West Bank and, and Gaza came in? That's right. So when you talk about the, the, uh, the Israeli occupation of places like the West Bank, or even Golan, that is a legacy of the June 1967 war. Okay. I, I've i heard, I'm curious, because I've heard a few Israeli scholars say that they, they'll even admit that Israel keeping the West Bank and not giving it back to Jordan at the end of the 1967 war was a terrible right. mistake, and that it could right. have avoided a lot of the things that we're dealing with today. Do you think in line with that or, or do you what are your thoughts on israel keeping the west bank after 1967 well you know i i think you're you're right to point out there's um israeli israeli civil society and among scholars it's, there's an incredible breadth of different opinions there's really rich um scholarship both of from arab perspectives and israelis on the legacy of the war so a lot of times when i teach this i don't really interject my own opinion i kind of represent the best uh arguments i've come across um, from those different perspectives or those different narratives. So I think on the one hand, you have um, um, advocates saying that we needed we needed to keep the West Bank and certainly the Golan. These were strategically important geographically to defend Israeli borders from another another attack from its Arab neighbors. You know, the Golan Heights are this mountainous region that it represents a high point between Syria and Israel. You can go mm -hmm. and or you used to be able to go and, and tour that you can actually be on the Golan, look down into Syria and see some of the UN presence there since the, since the civil war in Syria. And you, you're literally looking down into Syria. And so if you're, if you're a military strategist, you understand the importance of maintaining the Golan. At the mm -hmm. same time, you have local communities there that are basically stateless people. You have Druze communities that used to be part of Syria. They had a Syrian passport at one point after 67. They may have Israeli citizens. Some of them don't want it. So they're in this, you have these local communities that are, don't really have a, have a, have a passport. They're stateless yeah. people. Yeah. Because of that occupation, same thing in the West Bank. Um, those areas are importantly, extraordinarily important. If you're an Israeli Zionist, um, it's telling, right, that there are at least four or five different ways to describe that territory, right? For settlers and kind of the the extreme right wing, you refer to that as Judea and Samaria. It's not the mm. occupied territory. It's not the West Bank. It's not the state of Palestine or the Palestinian Authority. It is Judea and Samaria. Mm. And so you would see, of course, this was a stunning victory. We need to keep this land. This is the land. This is the place where Father Abraham received the land from Yahweh. Like, why would yeah. we give that back? At the same time, you're Palestinian saying, well, this is, I mean, places like Bethlehem are extraordinarily important for Palestinians, especially if you're an Arab Christian, right? Like Bethlehem and Nazareth, like for historic reasons, you could understand why you would want sovereignty over those places. It's the birthplace of Christianity. Yeah. So so the borders, the, the modern borders as we know it are set by... The Six Day War in 1967. That's right. I'm, I'm sorry if I missed this. What, what was the the impetus for this war? Because in 1948, it was Israel declaring independence. That was, you know, what sort of ha helped things. 
pop off? What, what, what was the, I, I'm sorry for saying pop off with, with a war, <laughs> like pop off, uh, you know, like I, I shoot run round into my ceiling, like in the movie, the other guys doing a desk pop, yeah, yeah, but right. that was, just, that was just the first thing that popped into my head. Um, sure. but yeah, what, what was the impetus for the war of 1967 from both sides? So it was similar in that the, uh, the Israeli defense forces get word of a preemptive invasion by the surrounding Arab states, and they respond uh, through an act of preemptive war to prevent another land incursion into Israel. And so um, the reason it ends so quickly is that the Israeli Air Force is basically able to interdict um, um, offensive forces coming into Israel. And the, the majority of the combat happens over the course of one week or perhaps one month. Um, so it was a um, it was a stunning uh, tactical military victory in response to a preemptive invasion by the, the surrounding yeah. Arab states. So kind of a similar scenario to what you saw in forty eight, um, but um, this was the Israeli response to that. And of course, for the Palestinians and for neighboring Arab states, there's a question of okay, we need to recapture these lands and recover from the humiliation of nineteen forty eight, um, prevent the expansion of Israeli territory. And so there's even. There's some there's some good uh, different accounts of the '67 war from Israeli military historians, from Americans, from Arab perspectives. Um, yeah. So that even has a series of different. I mean, putting all that aside, though, it's important to know that when you talk about the occupation, you're primarily going back to '67 and where you draw the lines. Is it before the '67 war or after the war? Yeah. So to to fast forward to the the '90s to the to the Oslo peace accords. Would it be would it be fair to say that the current crisis in Gaza, a lot of it stems back to the breakdown of the peace accords in Oslo? Yeah, certainly. So by the 1990s, a uh, couple political facts are pretty uh, transformative, right? By that time, by the beginning of Oslo and the, the diplomacy surrounding a two-state solution in Europe and then later in Washington, you have a peace treaty between Egypt and Israel. So... Uh, Egypt gets back the Sinai Peninsula and there's peace between Israel and Egypt by 1978, 1979, which is massive, right? That's a fundamental mm -hmm. transformation of, of, of international politics there. By the early 1990s, I think it's something like 1994, Jordan and Israel are at peace. Mm. So you have two Arab-Israeli peace. And at that point, by the early 90s, there's a transformation of the conflict from an Arab-Israeli conflict to an Arab-Palestinian one, where it becomes a matter of domestic politics and local uh, um, Israeli-Palestinian relations more so than that of Israel and the neighboring Arab states. And so um, during the Oslo process, then you get the creation of a Palestinian government in the West Bank. This thing we call the Palestinian Authority, which is basically the government of Palestine, uh, comes out of that Oslo process. It's like a seven or eight year process that ends up collapsing in 2000, but is really important for setting the stage to what we see uh, currently. Yeah. So... C could you tell the story of how the the Oslo Accords collapsed? It was at Camp David under Bill Clinton. How, what what were the main points of negotiation, and and how did that all fall apart? Because it sounds like it ended terribly. Right. So you had that famous photo of Yasser Arafat and his Israeli counterpart shaking hands on the White House lawn early in in the in the Clinton presidency, and obviously Bill Clinton is looking back at Jimmy Carter helping negotiate peace between Israel and Egypt and saying, I want this to be my legacy as well. Just like the, the progressive Democrat, Jimmy Carter, I want to pursue this. So beginning at, in Bill Clinton's first term, you have negotiations between Yasser Arafat, who was the leader of the Palestinian Liberation Organization, was recognized as a legitimate negotiating partner with the Israelis. He's no longer considered a freedom fighter, or terrorist, or revolutionary. He's now a political negotiating partner for the mm -hmm. Israeli government. Um, and you have uh, debates over where you're going to draw the lines on the map. It gets really complicated when you talk about the West Bank. Over that time, there's this, this, this plan to divide the West Bank into three different zones, zones A, B, and C. One zone is going to be controlled entirely by the Israeli military. I think that's zone C. One is entirely under the control of the Palestinian Authority. And then zone B is, is, is joint custody between, era, uh, between Palestinians and Israelis. And so you get lots of complicated political arrangements of how you carve up uh, land in the West Bank. Uh, the problem all along is that if you're a Palestinian nationalist, you want sovereignty and independence for the Palestinian people. Um, you view the Palestinian Authority as basically a client state of the Israelis, that the Israelis mm -hmm. are outsourcing their politics and security to the PA. And so there's already suspicion of the PA as basically being a client force of Israel. 
And so um, it makes it very difficult for the Palestinian Authority, especially after the death of Yasser Arafat, to gain complete legitimacy with Palestinians in the West Bank. I mean, keep in mind at the same time, you have Palestinians in the West Bank on the one hand and then Gaza on the other. So it's a Palestinian state that's non-contiguous. Like how are you going to, is there any uh, territorial way to connect these two areas? Very mm -hmm. difficult, right? And so that's, I mean, the politics of who's going to govern what territory comes in a bit later. But by 2000, Bill Clinton's leaving office. He wants to bring back um, Arafat and and the Israeli prime minister. I think it's Ehud Barak. I have to go and, and check. Um, but you have his Israeli and Palestinian negotiating parties going back to Camp David, Maryland, negotiating over, okay, where are we going to draw the lines? And there, once again, you have two different narratives of why those talks break down. Mm. If you're an Israeli, especially a pro-Zionist Israeli, right, a defender of that process, say, listen, we came to the table. We promised the Palestinian Authority something like 90 percent of the land they were requesting. Right? An overwhelming, you know, we compromised up to 90 plus percent of the territory to form a new Palestinian state. Mm. If you're a Palestinian, you're saying, listen, Yasser Arafat was in an impossible position. Any, um, um, It was a disingenuous offer on the one hand, even if it was something that, that the Israeli government would 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 stick to, would, would abide by those terms. Uh, if Arafat accepts that deal, he comes home and is fundamentally delegitimated in the eyes of the Palestinian people. So it not only is his per career over, his life is threatened. Mm. Right? So the fact that the Israeli narrative or the, the Israeli Zionist narrative, rather, that, that uh, um, Yasser Arafat walks away, walks, walks, walks away from those negotiations, is one that's already super contentious. Palestinians say, well, this was a disingenuous offer. The Israelis say, hey, we offered you 90%. You chose not to have a state. Mm. Yeah, those are the, that's at least two or three different narratives surrounding the breakdown of Camp David. After 2000, you really have the death knell of a two-state solution. Any any political momentum towards a two-state solution by 2000, 2001 um, um, is is delayed, if, if not really stillborn. So what, that's an important starting spot to under, beginning place to understand what we're going through yeah. now as well. Why yeah. was the the offer from the Israeli side for ninety percent considered disingenuous? Did did uh, the, the Palestinians did it, did Arafat not believe that they would actually give up ninety percent, or or what was the 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 uh, kind of uh, the reason why it wasn't seen as a legitimate offer? Right, there's some of that. There's a, whenever you're in a negotiation, whether in business or in politics. There's always the question of how credible is my negotiating partner? Mm. Are they? Are they? Do they have both the ability and the resolve, the desire to stick by the terms of the agreement? And so that's the classic gotcha. conundrum. If you're negotiating business or politics or interpersonally, you need to be able to perceive of the ability and resolve or the desire of your negotiating partner to stick by the terms. That's part of it. You know, I think fun, more fundamentally, it's questions over things that we're still that that we're still debating to this day. It's who gets control of East Jerusalem? Is that going to mm. be part of the state of Israel? Is that going to be part of a, a Palestinian state? Obviously, Jerusalem is the capital. is super important. It, it, there's a reason they call the old city God's zip code. You have the Temple Mount, which is important for Israelis and Muslims, or uh, Jews and, and Muslims around the world. Down the street, a 10-minute walk, you have the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, the place of, at least according to church tradition, where you have the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Okay, so in this very small area, you have um, extremely important religious sites. And for Palestinians, East Jerusalem is, is, is equally important in terms of their state sovereignty. So not getting control of, of um, certain parts of East Jerusalem and other, other areas of the West Bank is, is, is a, is a non-negotiable non compromise. Yeah. And, and also, th it, it seems like there's so many things that could go on in a negotiating room that don't actually make it into the final papers. Like, uh, I, yeah. I've heard stories of people like, like world leaders making jokes at another leader's expense and that sort of swayed the opinion of someone at the negotiating table because they didn't like the guy being joked about. And, and they sort of chimed in and were like, yeah, fuck that guy too. Like he's a yeah. you know piece of shit. And then all of a sudden the deal gets passed. So it, it would be, it, it would be surreal to be able to, be a fly on the wall for that conversation between Israel and Palestine at Camp David to sort of see the nuance of what was that moment where one side's body language sort of changed and, and decided, yeah, we're not going to pass this. Was it actually something that had to do with the deal? Was it 
a disrespectful comment was you, you know someone said something about the other guy's wife like what 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 actually yeah. like led yeah. to the deal breaking down Th- that's right yeah. and even if you if you go back and you watch some of the early video footage of the famous handshake in 1993 both the Palestinian and Israeli leaders being very hesitant to extend their hand first and so you see Bill Clinton standing there in the background the backgrounds in the the White House in the background it's very picturesque setting and he's pushing Yasser Arafat they're pushing them together, Rubin and Arafat, because no one wants to be the first to extend their hand. Because that would just be embarrassment, right? It's kind of a it's it's emasculating for you to be the first to offer your hand, especially in the Arab world, right? To, yeah. To um do something that would slight slight your manhood is a is a big big deal. And so you can even just see that in the video footage. And there's lots of great documentaries and and testimonials of what happens at Camp David over the few weeks in 2000. Um, you know, as a scholar, as a, and as a political scientist, I kind of zoom back and think about. This is a classic problem in international diplomacy when you get extremists on both sides basically setting terms that they know their negotiating partners can't abide by. And we see that even now in 2023. You have political extremists that are making demands they know that their negotiating partners cannot compromise on. And so the failure of Camp David in 2000 is one of these classic classic examples of uh, spoilers both within the Israeli hard right and the Palestinian right and left basically spoiling any chance of a peace deal because they have terms that are that are, that you can't abide by whether that's uh, the the hard the hard right in Israel or Hamas uh, their original charter saying that they're the, the state of Israel by definition is inherently illegitimate not just the occupation but the presence of the state of Israel yeah whenever I see those iconic handshake pictures whether it's with with Clinton and Arafat or or Trump and Kim jong-un it, it always yeah. it always makes me think of a UFC face-off where the two guys are there. They're not supposed to touch each other. And things are supposed to remain respectful, but it's also it, it's entertainment. But it's also a show of masculinity, and it's a show of who's going to blink first. Like people read so right, into right. it, where they're like, "Oh, you know, McGregor was looking down at the ground, and this other guy he was facing what Bahera wasn't, and so that means Bahera is going to win the fight." And it's just like right. when you have an, a leader of two countries doing that, where you're representing an entire nation, it, I can only imagine the amount of pressure on a leader to not blink or not look at the ground or like, I, I feel like it would be so funny if one of them, you know, if they, if they made a joke out of it, you know, Clinton pulls his hand away or something, I don't know, like makes a joke, goes to do rock, paper, scissors, one or one guy leans in and whispers in the air, ear. You know, like I, I'm actually really ticklish, and then just starts tickling the uh, <laughs> the other dude, yeah. other dude's hand. But it, yeah, it's it's I don't know those iconic photos. I'm I'm always wondering like what what was it like in the minds of those two people that were actually doing it. And there's even just really interesting stuff. I think you're right to point out the interpersonal dynamics, right, and the nonverbal communication. It's a lot of this is like pretty primitive, especially when it's men negotiating, right? But oh there's yeah. There's also just the the optics of stuff. See, there's all these great stories about Arafat that in terms of pictures wanting to be uh, photographed or in these negotiations with his holster. You know, they don't want him to have his pistol with him, but it's important that he is portrayed as a revolutionary leader. So even if he doesn't have the pistol in there, he wants the leather holster in the picture to show that he's not only a politician, but he's a revolutionary. Yeah. And just like the optics of how these photos are staged or the settings. I mean, even just you saw the clip yesterday or two days ago of uh, Biden meets with Xi Jinping in, in, in San Francisco Afterwards, he's giving a talk and the secretary of state sitting in the first row and Biden goes goes off and calling Xi Jinping a dictator. And you can see the video clip of Tony Blink and the secretary of state just grimacing. He's kind of doing this and, and he's looking yeah. super uncomfortable because he knows that the president has just made his job much more difficult yeah. by calling the Chinese leader a, a dictator. Yeah. It's just all interpersonal stuff, right? That that's That is – a lot of that is super important to, polit- to international diplomacy. Yeah. No. The, yeah, you're right. The, whether it's – what you're saying or having the, the optics, like having a holster or, or holding an AK 47 or something, or, or one guy's doing grip strength to lead up to the hand strike to, yeah. to go, I'm, I'm going to crush this motherfucker's hand when the, when the time comes, he's going to know, I'm going to look him dead in the face and I'm going to make him my wife. And yeah. that, uh, yeah, that, that's all interesting. Um, so finally we're, we're in the we're in the 2000s as you mentioned the, the status quo since 2000 has been the one state reality in Israel uh Gaza yeah. strip is blockaded 2 million Gazans uh essentially in an open air prison 
and Israel occupies much of the West Bank. And Hamas is voted into power in 2006. Is, is that something around then they have the elections? Yeah, so we have to actually we have to rewind a bit and yeah. actually go back to post two thousand to set the stage. Yeah, yeah. Because the blockade doesn't come into effect until two thousand five. Okay. As uh two thousand, so there's a couple legacies of the breakdown of Camp David. First is the stillbirth of the two state solution. The next is the the political uh unviability, the basically the political death of the Israeli left. So you have lots of left center left politicians trying to basically betting the farm on the two state solution. And people like uh, uh, Ehud Olmert, right, and Kadima party, these left and center left parties. The breakdown of Camp David and the rise of the second intifada, the second uprisings in 2000, 2001, basically is the political and and economic defeat of the Israeli left. And we haven't really seen the recovery of a left wing, a viable left wing presence in Israel after that, at least electorally. Because what happens is Camp David breaks down, uh, the Israeli left's humiliated, and you have the second intifada. And so for a period of several years, you have suicide bombings and buses in Jerusalem. Mm. The, first intifada, the first uprising was late 80s, far less violent than the second uprising. And so you have lots of people that were uh, ardent leftists or progressives in Israel that saw the, camp da- the breakdown of Camp David and the second intifada as basically the death of their optimism or hope mm. for a two-state solution or the viability of, of, of a peace plan. And so between you have the end of, of, of the Oslo process, you have the second intifada, the Israelis are occupying Gaza. By 2005, they leave. And so there's a there's a there's both a political and a strategic calculus to evacuate or redeploy out of the Gaza Strip. So this is not only like militarily complicated. It's um, for uh, Israeli Jews that live in Gaza. It's extraordinarily traumatic. They're, they're removed from their homes. Doug's uh, graves are, are uprooted and moved. Any Israeli presence in Gaza is totally evacuated. And so the the Israeli military line is, okay, fine, you guys are going to govern yourselves. We're going to leave. Um, there's the decision to have a, an election within the Palestinian uh, Liberation Organization. You have different factions. Outside of that is Hamas. Hamas is an Islamist political party. They're a revolutionary movement that has both a political agenda and a military agenda. They, they have a political party that wins elections in Gaza in 2006. There is an interpolitical dispute between the Palestinian Authority and the West Bank and Hamas and in Gaza, where Hamas ends up killing Fatah party members. So there's inner, there's political violence between Palestinian factions. Mm. The Israelis say, okay, fine, we're leaving. Hamas, you've won. We're going to introduce a blockade. And starting in 2005, 2006, they turn uh, Gaza into an open air prison. There's mm. a, a land blockade on, on two of the Israeli borders and also on the Egyptian side at the Rafah crossing. And there's a blockade at sea that limits how far Palestinian fishing vessels can go out mm. uh, for, for fishing other forms of commerce. And so they basically, not basically, they turn, uh, they introduce a, 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 a really invasive military blockade in the Gaza Strip saying, okay, you want Hamas to rule, you go ahead and govern. So if you're a Palestinian, you say, okay, on the one hand, we had this election. The elections were canceled after that point. Very few Palestinians, even in 2006, 2007, had any hope that Hamas could govern. But at the same time, you realize it's kind of disingenuous. It's like, how is a, a party, regardless of an Islamist party or a secular one, supposed to govern when all your borders are under blockade and the Israeli military controls access to imports and, and water treatment, electricity and internet and all these things that states need to provide in order mm. to have basic governance. You need to be able to provide public goods and services. Mm. So yeah, that just creates another dilemma, right? It's, 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 yeah. Um, and so the, the Gaza... And then, you know, between 2005 and the present, you have two, three, four year bouts of sporadic violence coming out of Gaza and the Israeli Air Force retaliating. And that's the pattern we've seen between in the last uh, 18 years or so. So so who who is Hamas exactly and and what does Hamas want in terms of uh, politically, but also militarily and and religiously? Yeah, so Hamas is the, um, it's an acronym for an Islamic resistance movement. It is indigenous to Palestinian politics, though it comes out of a much broader movement called the Muslim Brotherhood. Late 1920s in, in, in Egypt, you have a political movement uh, of the Muslim Brotherhood trying to figure out how do we integrate Islam into politics? How do we actually make Islam viable, not only in the religious sphere, but also in the political one? And in the intervening 70 or 80 years, there's with debates, there's uh, Muslim Brotherhood movements throughout the Middle East trying to figure out how do we 
can we prevent present a viable political alternative to colonialism on the one hand and secular dictators on the other? You have lots mm. of political experiments throughout the Middle East after World War II. First, we had colonial overlords. We had the Ottomans there and then the British and the French. After independence, we've had military leaders, some civilian ones. They've all been autocrats. Very few, uh, they pay lip service to Islam, but they're not true Muslims. What would it look like to actually have Islam as a viable political movement? Um, mm. And so that's motivated lots of different, lots of different movements in, in Iraq and, and Jordan and, and Lebanon and elsewhere. By the late 1980s, you have both Hezbollah and Hamas as, as not only militant movements, but political parties. So Hamas's original charter was the elimination of the state of Israel. They've since revised that where it is, um, they've tried to make the, um, their founding documents less anti-Semitic. Uh, I'm skeptical that that's actually the, the case. So you can yeah. read two different versions of it, right? The Israelis say, well, this is disingenuous. They're lying to us just like they always have. Palestinians say, well, Hamas is not only a militant movement, it's a political one. They've revised their political stance. It is, um, it is disingenuous or, or dishonest to conflate Hamas's politics with their, their militancy. Um, mm. So, they, so it's a party that, that, that basically said that the Palestinian Authority, the secular Palestinian Liberation Organization, this is not going to end the occupation, right? Yeah. And one of the fundamental insights is um, the only way the international community is going to pay attention to this conflict is when there's violence. Mm. There's the Oslo process and people paid attention. It kind of fizzles up. The only time the international community reengages on this issue is when there's an intifada or an uprising. Mm. So, it, so there's it is is there uh, is there a clear delineation between Hamas's political uh, a, a clear delineation between what they want to uh, accomplish politically and then also the 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 terrorist attacks the the part in their charter where they declare jihad against the jews is is that all intertwined into one are the same people who are committing these attacks also functioning politically somehow and going out and you know sp being you know quote unquote politicians in gaza or is there a, a separation between the politics and the violence the, you know, I think there's a symbiotic relationship. As an outsider, though, it, it's extre extremely difficult to tell where mm. those dividing lines are. And this is the case. This is another one of those things where we started the conversation. As Americans or even Western Europeans, we uh, we fail to appreciate that in a lot of places in the world, there are political parties that have armed groups. Mm. Okay, so that's in Northern Ireland during the Troubles. You had Sinn Féin and the Irish Republican Army. In Colombia, you have parties that also have armed, re armed wings. And in the Middle East, this is common all over the place. The political parties also have muscle, right? They have enforcement. Um, and so Hamas and Hezbollah are no different there. Um, mm. And so it's difficult It's difficult to say where that dividing line is. Of course, now the, the political leadership of Hamas is in Qatar. They, they live in a, in a tiny, in a tiny uh, uh, um, Arab state in the Persian Gulf. They're not in Gaza, right? The military, some of the military leaders are, but the leadership of Hamas is spread out between Gaza and Egypt and Qatar. Mm. So, so we're recording this about five weeks after the October seventh right. attacks. What were your immediate thoughts when you first heard about and and saw the attacks on October seventh? Right. So I was uh, I was here in Logan, Utah. I think I was working out. I was at the gym, and I got some news alerts that there was an attack coming out of Gaza. Um, I initially dismissed it. Um, I was too cavalier with that because what I expected it to be is what we've seen in the last 18 years, where there's a volley of improvised rockets coming out of Gaza, targeting Israeli cities. The Israelis respond with this Iron Dome missile interception system where they shoot down the rockets, some land, maybe they damage property or injure people, very few Israeli casualties. And we, we would see this traditional volley of rockets coming out of Gaza, the Israeli military responding with the Air Force and kind of this tit for tat cycle that would just became kind of routine. This perverse kind of routine that, yeah. that that we've seen. Only later did I realize, well, this was an incursion out of Gaza, where you had to, um, over a thousand uh, Hamas militants leaving um, over land borders in the air and in the sea on on improvised uh, um, gliders and speedboats, um, and and using bulldozers to knock down the borders, the yeah. gates uh, and walls of the Gaza Strip. Um, and that's when uh, the reality that that sinks in that this is not only that the initial uh, rocket attack out of Gaza was a diversion. 
It was mm. a diversionary attack to catch the Israeli defense forces off guard. And then you had the ground incursion. It starts with an attack on IDF uh, military posts, outposts in southern Israel, outside of Gaza, in this area called the Envelope. And then also extends to killing something like uh, 1,200 plus Israeli civilians, men, women, children, elderly that are victimized, murdered, and then now um, 239 or so um, of those are kidnapped. The, the, the majority are Israeli Jews, so there's also international citizens taken yeah. hostage. And so it escalates and, it's, and it's, it's, it's a spasm of violence that we had just not been accustomed to, at least on the Israeli side, um, um, uh, since, since 1945. And mm. so that, that experience, how Israeli Jews experienced that and how Palestinians did both in the West Bank and Gaza is is is, is different as well. Um, if you're if you're a citizen of Gaza, you're saying, listen, um, the uh, people of Gaza have suffered for 18 years. The Israeli military has killed hundreds of Gazans, hundreds of Palestinians with zero recourse. Um, this is routine for us. You know, we've experienced this for the last 18 years. There's nothing um, nothing uh, overwhelmingly distinct about the 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 10 seven attacks. Um, mm -hmm. Even if we even if we denounce an attack on civilians. Mm -hmm. And obviously the the Israeli side would be a complete 180 of that where it's an uh, an unprovoked terrorist attack. Obviously the uh you know th th there's so many videos out there that have been released by the IDF and they're hard to watch but it's uh yeah the when we talk about the politics of it the bodies that get lost the, the bodies the, the the people tend to get lost in that that conversation so right a lot of times i when i watch things like that or i read about attacks like that my mind immediately goes to who needs to die to prevent this from ever happening again so and it's hard to just kind of turn that switch off and go, all right, like this is fucking awful. This is tragic. This is horrific. You know, th this loss of human life, uh, you know, th th it's, it's unspeakable and, and it's also incredibly complex and nuanced, but the, yeah, I, I don't even know if I have my full thoughts together on the attacks yet because more and more footage and more and more details are being released and it's hard to know what's true, what what's not true with the, the information. Um, did, did you have any sort of uh, – like where did, where did your mind go? I don't know if you watch any of the footage from either side, from the IDF or from Hamas, but did your mind go to – an incredibly dark place did it did it go to did it sort of just blank out like what what was your personal response to it so uh, yeah i think it was it was multi-layered right so um it's coming from someone that i have um uh friends and colleagues both in the west bank and in israel and in gaza that have lost people in this so that this is one of these situations where this was not just an area political event that was important to me as an expert but it was affecting me as a, as an individual that has friends and and close colleagues in these areas that are intimately feeling the effects of the violence. And so that was really disorienting on the one hand. On the other, it reminded me of uh, the Russian incursion into Ukraine in February 2022. I, the morning that incursion was happening, Putin was sending tanks out of Crimea into eastern Ukraine. Uh, was I was teaching a class on international politics. We were teaching the politics of war and peace. Mm. And as as the invasion was starting that morning, right, because I'm in on Mountain Standard Time, I pull up my Twitter feed in the beginning of class, and it's just information overload of pictures and videos and text of a military invasion in real time. It was totally disorienting. Hard to know, you know, from GoPro footage and cell phones and drones and different perspectives of the same events. And uh, it's just total information overload. Mm. Um, similar situation on October 7th, where you saw the most reliable information during the, the first day or two of the attack was not coming from the government of Israel or the Palestinian Authority or the Israeli Defense Forces. It was coming from citizen journalists and cell phone footage and um, uh, Hamas militants using victim cell phones to record yeah. victimization of women and kids and just terrible stuff um, where um, it, it's totally disorienting. And you realize that the fog of war, what Klauswitz talks about the fog of war, 
that our technology, just because we have smartphones on the internet, we have, uh, that's a human thing. We're unable to overcome the disorientation and confusion that war brings, especially in the, in the opening salvo, right? That, that even with social media, it actually obfuscates more than it clarifies. It muddies mm-hmm. the water more than it clarifies or cleans it. Yeah. And so I, I had to disengage from social media. I, I had contacts. I was on the phone on WhatsApp, talking with friends and, and colleagues, trying to get a sense of what was more or less reliable. Um, the Israeli government and even the American government for the first week could not give an, a, 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 an account of how many people were first killed how many people were in country during the attack and how many American hostages? I remember in the first two week or two, the president and, and the State Department were saying, well, it's something like less than a dozen people. It's like, what? You can't tell me how many Americans are held hostage in Gaza? Mm. Right? Yeah. Yeah, I, I've seen I, I've seen some reports where Hamas has allegedly been planning this attack on October 7th for 18 months to two, three years, possibly longer. What do you think drove Hamas to attack Israel at this moment, as opposed to, you know, next year or a couple of years before? Well, it's, yeah, that's like the sixty-four thousand dollar question, right? What yeah. motivated the attack, and why is it at that time point? I've I've seen different perspectives on it. Uh, some experts in international politics would say, well, this was a purposeful attack to derail the Abraham Accords, specifically the peace deal between Saudi Arabia and Israel. This was meant to spoil. The, solid, the the signing of, and, and rapprochement between Riyadh and Tel Aviv, that plays in part some of it. I think um, there's a reality that escalatory violence is the only way that um, Hamas and supporters of Hamas see that the, the occupation getting on the radar of the international community. So we need to use escalatory violence in order to draw attention to this. And this is the only way we can get the release of Palestinians that are imprisoned in Israel, um, yeah. some of which have been formally charged, uh, hundreds if not thousands of which face no formal charges right mm. and so they they, they viewed um this this victimization of civilians as a bargaining chip they saw it work in the past when they have kidnapped israeli soldiers being able to release um palestinian prisoners so there's part of that um strategic logic perhaps on the ground there's the international political side i mean there's still questions i haven't seen any reliable reporting or analysis on whether or not the political wing of hamas was really cued in to the attacks Mm. To what extent did Hamas's political leaders in Qatar know about Al Qassam Brigade's attacks, either in the yeah. planning and, and, and the extent to which um, it was clear that Hamas targets both uh, ended up targeting both civilians and IDF soldiers? If this was an attack that was limited to the military, it would have been they would have been legitimate targets. It would have been an escalation, but it would have looked far different than the fact that it extends to killing twelve hundred or eleven hundred Israeli civilians. Yeah, right, and so. Um, the, the, the motivate you can think about the, the politics, what's the political motivation, but you also have to think about what's the motivation of people um, on the ground? What is what what are people facing, right? Um, mm. in order to be able to kill to kill civilians, either um, Palestinian civilians or in this case Israeli civilians. Um, you have accounts of Hamas militants phoning in, calling family, saying, Listen, we you know, I was able to, we got through the gates, I was able to kidnap or kill these these Israeli Jews. And the parents of these fighters, there's there's some clips of they're just devastated. They're saying, Okay, well, come home. Uh, we mm. don't know what's going on, but just come home. Yeah. Um, the Atlantic reporter, Graham Wood, has been really good on this. He's a good source to just track these individual narratives Yeah. Um, of these mostly young men going out. They're hyped up on amphetamines and uh, and other drugs, right? And then ends up being just this uh, uh, spasmatic, just brutal acts of inhumane violence. Yeah. Um, no, and, and, and it seems like in terms of the – the attack with just the amount of civilians and military targets, uh, IDF soldiers that Hamas was able to kill in within hours. It, it seems like even they were surprised by how, you know, if you want to call it successful or how effective their attack the was. Right. Right. Yeah, because there, there are so like some of the most gruesome videos. Obviously, the carnage is incredibly gruesome, but like when you see a Hamas militant toss a grenade into a house and then they go in and pick up a piece of fruit and they're just kind of like casually just like, oh, I have so much time. Like no one's here trying to stop us. I'm just going to like go through the fridge because the fruit was inside. It didn't get destroyed by the grenade and they're just like eating fruit as bodies are burning outside. It's like the 
it's it's like they almost didn't know what to do with the extra time. They're like, I guess we should just, you know, keep going if no one's going to going to show up. There's certainly an absurdity to it. There's a disorientation both yeah. from combatants and civilians. Right. And I think there's this I think you're right that there there's an there is a the the amount of uh, carnage they were able to unleash in such a shortened time span was just uh, unexpected. And so you have everyday uh, um, rank and file soldiers, right? Terrorists in this case, just kind of confuses. Well, what do we do next? Where do we go? Um, confusion over whether or not the the initial plans were to uh, primarily target Israeli defense forces. You know, in the in the days after the attack, the spokesperson for Hamas says, "Well, we only targeted." IDF soldiers. It's like, that's patently false, right? There's an interview between a Hamas spokesperson and a reporter in Saudi Arabia. And to, to her credit, this woman calls this guy to account and says, that's not true. You killed civilians. Mm. And then there's the extent of, okay, which, to what extent did this violence escalate? Obviously, we talked about the fog of war, the fact that just, um, in my experience, it, either in political protests or acts of political violence, things escalate very quickly. And you don't need that many bad actors for situations to get very, very violent or dangerous. Mm. I tell when you, you know, one of the I tell my students when they do study abroad, one of the worst things you can do is go to a public protest, even if you think it's peaceful and exciting. You just don't know how these things escalate and they can get violent uh, very, very quickly. And even in a large crowd of people, you don't need that many bad actors to escalate yeah. and, and really increase violence. Um, yeah, no, that's that's just as a side tangent. That's that's something that we've been lucky enough to not experience with the Panamanian Roblox, but there have been yeah. plenty of fights between farmers and protesters because the farmers can't get their produce through they're throwing out thousands of gallons of milk a day they're tossing out right. vegetables and then you also there was a protester not a protester there was a uh panamanian the other day who went up to a roadblock and just shot two protesters and then started directing traffic telling people like you're good now we can go through yeah. the road and that was caught on video and that that was that was wild to watch so it's like we, you know, me, me and my, my girlfriend were careful to be very aware of our surroundings and not get too close to the actual roadblock. And if we are sort of right there, we'll just, you know, leave our car and, and go somewhere else until the, the roadblock ceases. That's right. You know, and, and we've in the last few years, unfortunately, have observed some of that, you know, whether that's Charlottesville, Virginia, or yeah. January 6th attacks, the insurrection on the Capitol, um, so much, but nothing to the scale. Um, and so that, that's, I think the, how Israelis or many of my Israeli friends and colleagues experience that in Gaza, you saw the response where you had the Israeli defense force, the Israeli military sp spokesperson calling them human animals. And so you just see massive, uh, um, dehumanization of Palestinians, not just Hamas, but the collective victimization of Palestinian civilians mm. as being morally culpable for the attacks, the dehumanization uh, coming out of parts of Netanyahu's coalition, including the radical right wing that is in Netanyahu's coalition. Yeah. And it's heartbreaking. It's specifically heartbreaking to see this coming out of Israeli politicians in light of the the, the legacy of the Holocaust to call yeah. people human animals. It's like, it, it's devastating. And then the response, um, first the barrage of, of airstrikes and artillery killing, uh, not only destroying infrastructure, displacing people, killing Palestinian civilians. Um it's just a, um, it's a really tragic cycle of violence. And, 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 and since 1967, if anything, we realized that retaliatory violence is not going to advance the peace process. There's not going to, if there, if the political solution to this conflict were going to come by using escalating violence, we have, we have already reached it. Mm. Uh, this, is a, this is a political problem that can't primarily be solved with military force. Yeah. So, so going off of Netanyahu and the Israeli government, obviously the October 7th attack couldn't happen without some pretty massive intelligence failures, or it couldn't have happened to the extent that it did without massive right. intelligence failures, failures, not only by the Israeli government, but other people tracking it in Europe and the United States. So right. to, to your understanding, what, how, how did such a huge blind spot develop in the intelligence for Hamas and, and what does this attack say about um, Hamas's tactical ability and intentions? Right, the, the, there's a big question there. I'm, I'm less of an expert on military intelligence, and I have less insight into the the breakdown in, in, yeah. in intelligence failure. We'll, we'll see that. Um, a colleague of mine, uh, Bob Jervis, who recently passed, wrote a great book on intelligence failures, and he talks about the different reasons why elite 
intelligence and military forces make mistakes. Um, I'm sure we're going to revisit that that book in light of what we see here. I think, obviously, the Israeli Defense Force has this really prolific reputation as a very, very effective military force that comes out in 1967, right? That was like the Israelis' Band of Brothers moment, mm-hmm. victory in the 67 war. Um, and we forget that within the Israeli military, the conventional forces are all conscripts, right? Every Israeli man and woman at age 18 has to serve in the armed forces. And so the rank and file uh, uh, soldiers at military checkpoints and outposts throughout Israel, particularly in the South, they are conscripts. They're not special forces. These aren't the elite of the elite, mm. right? And so it, and, 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 and in some respect, it's unsurprising that they'd be overrun. They weren't, they weren't um, trained or expecting. I think there's a large degree of complacency mm. uh, with Israeli security, whether that was the Iron Dome, this anti-missile, this missile defense system they installed, or their ability to really crack down uh, um, very effectively in the West Bank and, and ratchet up the blockade in Gaza. They thought they were primarily in a pretty good position. Yeah, The breakdown in intelligence for the domestic intelligence service in Israel, the Shin Bet, um, that's a massive failure. Um, we'll, we'll need to learn more in the coming months and years ahead. What's interesting to me is that Netanyahu has used the opportunity to basically shift blame on the attacks to the military and intelligence services and away from his Likud party and his own politics, mm. his own political viability. I mean, think about this in the context of the U.S. Imagine if President George W. Bush's first inclination was to blame the CIA and FBI for 9-11. Yeah. If in response to the attacks on the trade centers and the Pentagon in, in Shanksville, Pennsylvania, Bush gets on from behind the resolute desk in the Oval Office and says, this is primarily the risk a failure of the federal bureau of investigation like that's just ludicrous right and it, yeah. that's what netanyahu is doing he realizes that if he loses political power he's going to be indicted and, and convicted of corruption his career his political career is over and he may be going to jail yeah so it's just it's heartbreaking when i talk to my israeli friends regardless if they're conservative or progressives i think it's one in four maybe 25 or 30 percent have any confidence in the netanyahu coalition to be able to wage this war to restore deterrence to protect israelis and 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 be able to different discriminate between Hamas fighters and Palestinian civilians. Um, there, there's just lots of despair and nihilism and cynicism among Israelis that Netanyahu and his coalition can actually prosecute this war in a way that protects Israelis, that makes them safer. Yeah. And, and if you do have a huge lapse in your intelligence, or, you, or you, there is some fault in the intelligence community for an attack like uh, the Hamas attacks or 9-11, I feel like that is not what you lead with you, you you have private conversations you do what you need to do to plug the holes in your intelligence community but then you have a different message for the public well it depends on how you think about it right yeah. like if you're if you're interested in in safeguarding the nation or advancing the national interest i think you're right on the other hand if you're a leader and you're interested in staying in power that calculation is fundamentally different right one yeah. of the things we know about political leaders is when they get power they want to stay in power yeah, and so um, you have wars. Wars uh, break out and escalate when you have leaders that are insulated from the consequences of their decisions. Yeah, it's a super dangerous situation. Whether that leader is democratically elected, like in Israel, or an autocrat, if they're insulated from the immediate consequences of a war gone wrong, it's a very dangerous position to be in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The 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 need to stay in power definitely sways the message because there's there's another way to do it if you want to take personal responsibility, you could say, yeah, we had a, a lapse, a huge lapse in intelligence that led to this. And I'm also the president of the country. I'm responsible for appointing the people uh, in charge of the, the intelligence community. This is my responsibility. So I'm not blaming the intelligence community. I, I'm blaming myself. And also we're going to plug the holes where where the holes need to be plugged. But obviously, right. that's not what happened. That wasn't the the response. I've I've actually I, I've seen some reporting that indicates the opposite. That Netanyahu was warned repeatedly about the possibility of Hamas getting stronger and the the possibility of a, a highly organized attack. And those those uh, reports th- those warnings came from multiple nations, but were ultimately largely ignored by Netanyahu. Yeah, so in the, in, the, in the past month, there's been some credible reporting that the Egyptian government tried to warn the Israelis. Obviously, Egypt's in a very strange position. There's a peace deal between Egypt and Israel, but they also control the southern border of Gaza. So both mm. Cairo and Tel Aviv have it in their political interest to make sure there's not a violent spillover 
either into the Sinai in Egypt or into southern Israel. Uh, mm. I, I'm unsure of the credibility of that. You know, the Wall Street Journal came out days after the attack saying they had credible information linking Iran to the direct planning and support for the attacks. That's been unsubstantiated. Uh, certainly, uh, Hamas has received financial support from Iran. Um, in terms of logistics and planning, uh, it's too soon to tell how that was carried out. I mean, I think it's important when you think about Netanyahu and, and, the, and the government to realize that in the two years prior to these attacks, there's been massive civil protests throughout Israel mm. on democratic backside within Israel. So when Netanyahu gets back into power as prime minister, he builds a coalition, including coalition members that are extreme, a Jewish supremacist, extreme right wing, talking about annexing all of Judea and Samaria, uh, um, saying that there's no such thing as a Palestinian national identity. They're just Arabs. We should annex all of Judea and Samaria and the West Bank. Arab Palestinians can live in any other Arab state. And so when you have members of your coalition on the record calling for annexation, not just occupation, annexation, and calling for ethnic cleansing, mm. like the fact that the, there's a violent response is, is is tragic. Like, what do you expect when you when you get in get in bed with these extremists? Mm. At the same time, you have Israelis both on the left and right that were fed up with Netanyahu's uh, consolidation of power, trying to basically break the separation of powers between the courts and the Knesset, the parliament. Yeah, right? yeah. And if, so if you... that, oh, that no, sets ahead. the stage also for the political response that we saw. Right? It doesn't yeah. happen in a vacuum. Yeah, and I, I'll, if you're if you're Hamas, just going off of the the protests, and, and you're trying to plan an attack that's going to be as overwhelming and as as deadly as possible, you have the the protests going on with the Supreme Court. You have the Jewish High Holiday, and then you also yeah. have the uh, I think there were only like two or three battalions supposedly on the Gaza Strip of the IDF, and the rest were busy in the West Bank. So you have this trifecta of perfect opportunity that leaves Israel extremely vulnerable on their side of the Gaza border. And so if you were going to plan an attack, that is a pretty vulnerable time to to do so. Certainly. And it just realizes that when you have domestic political polarization, that actually undermines your national security. Yeah. We talk a lot about democratic backslide and the problem of creeping authoritarianism in democratic states. We fail to, to highlight how important that is for national security. That undermines your ability to protect your citizens at yeah. home and abroad, right? And so Israel is a tragic case of that. Yeah. Um, what, what are your, your thoughts on Israel's response to the Hamas attacks with, with the, the bombings and the ground war? Well, I, I can say a bit about the U.S. Uh, response and also the Israelis. Yeah. I think, yeah. you know, it's... it's um, the, the way the Israelis framed those, the 10 7 attacks is this was the most amount of carnage inflicted on the Jewish people since the Holocaust, since the Shoah, right? Mm -hmm. That's the one narrative that's been going around. The other is that this is like the effect of seven or eight 9 11s. Imagine if, if September 11th killed 30,000 or 40,000 Americans, right? Mm -hmm. Those are both kind of rhetorical ways to frame it. Um, but the response has just been, um, it's been overwhelming and it, um, the amount of civilian uh, collective victimization or, or collective violence against Palestinian civilians has been heartbreaking. Now, that, it's difficult to determine, right? The Israeli Defense Forces say, well, you can't trust the Gaza Ministry of Health. It's run by Hamas. That's true. I think you need to be skeptical of that. Um, those casualty estimates have also been verified or checked by Bet Salem, which is an Israeli human rights organization and others. So even if it's not 10,000 civilians, if it's eight, um, practically speaking, that doesn't really change the reality that you have a massive amount of Palestinian civilians that have been killed, displaced, and injured in response to this. And it's mm. uh, um, um, even if you grant that the Israeli Defense Force is discriminating between civilian and military targets, it's such a dense urban atmosphere environment that it's difficult to do that without collapsing civilian infrastructure. Yeah. Um, and and the, the Al Shifa the attack is a classic example of that, where you have same day you have multiple video uh, uh, angles, video footage trying to figure out, was this an errant uh, a rocket from Hamas or Islamic Jihad, or was this the Israeli Air Force? Was it intentionally targeted? Was it collateral damage? Um, yeah. The reality is, if you're a Palestinian civilian, it doesn't really matter if you were intentionally targeted or not. If your family members have been killed, if your home is destroyed, if you're on the street trying to flee south and public infrastructure roads are destroyed, it doesn't yeah. matter all that much, right? Yeah. It, it's a... Uh... I can identify with the, the the horrific just lack of mobility or the the 
the the lack of mobility on one side with being in Gaza and then also the need to have a response on Israel's side whether you know because you have Gaza you're in an open air prison there's 2 million people most of them are not Hamas and like you said if you're targeting Hamas if if uh, and you know if they're in tunnels under a hospital or if they're purposely using women and children as as human shields or or or, or hiding in places where there's going to be a high civilian casualty count right what do you do if you're Israel do you how do you eradicate Hamas without having this just awful civilian body count piling up and then if you're a civilian in Gaza what do you do if the Israel government is telling you, you know, get out of here, this is going to be, uh, there's going to be a ground attack and you have nowhere that you can go. You're, you're, you, you can't flee. The borders aren't opening up. Uh, you can move a little bit from North to South in Gaza, but you're still ultimately right there. How, right. how do you even like on one side, how do you, how do you, um, decide what to do if you're israel you obviously have to send a message to hamas you 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 were just attacked brutally you have to take out your enemies and at the same time how can you do that with limiting the civilian damage and not causing the humanitarian crisis that has broken out and and continues to exist so it's yeah it's just like a terribly bloody complex question that ultimately you know human lives of the civilians are, are going to pay the price for on both sides. Well, it's, and it's an asymmetric conflict. So it's like what we saw in during the battle for Mosul when the Iraqis and American forces were trying to defeat the Islamic state. This is not a conventional war. It's, it's fundamentally different than Russia, Ukraine. It's not over territory. It's not over holding territory. It's over the hearts and minds of the civilian population. It's about popular support. So I've had colleagues at Princeton, Amani Jamal and others that have surveyed Gazans before the war, and it turns out that 20%, one in five Gazans actually supported Hamas or had any confidence in Hamas to be able to deliver basic goods and services. If you look at public opinion of, of Palestinians in Gaza, there's very little support for Hamas. That's That that would be useful to know before you launch a, launch a counterattack. Hmm. At the same time, even prior to October 7th, something like three out of four Palestinians were food insecure. Yeah. 75% of the population, food insecure is typically measured by um, does a family or household have the ability to buy groceries at the end of the month? Do they have mm. enough in their in their their monthly earnings to buy food, right? And so even before those attacks, you had just extreme vulnerability and a lack of political legitimacy for Hamas. Uh, at the same time, you have the Israelis uh, facing a very difficult uh, adversary, and it, this is where the Americans need need to should have and continue to need to come in and tell the Israeli Defense Force. Uh, listen, you need to learn by the from the American lessons in Iraq and Afghanistan. When you say we're going to come in and destroy Hamas, you mean two different things. Uh, on the one hand, there's Hamas as an ideology. You cannot destroy an ideology with bombs and rockets and guns. Okay. Mm. On the other, you can say we're we're going to destroy this organization. Perhaps it's perhaps you're able to degrade and destroy a militant organization. We were able to do that with Al Qaeda in Iraq in 2009, 2010. The problem is what came in the aftermath of of, of Al Qaeda was ISIS. Okay, we destroy Al Qaeda in Iraq. Three years later, we get ISIS. Yeah. So we we tend to forget that uh, even if you're able to um, tactically destroy Hamas as an organization, there's something far worse that could take its place. So when you you basically flatten an area that is rife with re- religious extremism with terrorism, you create a vacuum where that that idea is ready to get sucked back in by a different group of people or by, or by um, you know, by, by a similar ideology that just goes by a different name, essentially. Right. And so um, the one thing we knew from public opinion research in the Middle East in particular is that when you start killing Arab civilians, support for radical groups goes up. Mm. Okay. So even if, even if support for Hamas is the party in charge was at 20% prior to the war, um, if we were able to safely survey Gazans through cell phones or internet connection, it wouldn't be a surprise if support has gone up since that point, given the the collective victimization of Palestinian civilians. Yeah. And, so, and we saw the same thing in Iraq. We've seen the same thing in Afghanistan. Um, um, these are just um, polit- militarily, they're fights where overwhelming military force does not allow you to win the political dimension of the war. Yeah. 
It's it seems like Israel responded in a way that is beneficial for Hamas because Hamas seems happy for the the civilian body count in Gaza to keep going up because it it will get global opinion back on the side of Palestine. A lot of people are anti-Israel in the sense that they see the they just see the numbers, the you know, the 10,000 on got in Gaza versus the 1,500 in Israel and they go, "Okay, body count. This this is right. like end of story. It's it's just a story of body count and Israel is the bully because Gaza is just getting absolutely flattened and destroyed and if you're Hamas, you're 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 probably like, "Yeah, you know, Israel's is coming for us, but at the same time we have the a lot of the global support whereas if israel may have uh if israel took a different approach to how they were going to eradicate hamas which you know i'm not a military strategist i don't know exactly what the other options would be i i don't know how you could what would be another approach to effectively eradicate hamas with less palestinian casualties i i have no idea i i there's you know obviously there's humanitarian corridors there's a lot of things that could have been done but if Israel didn't attack to the extent that they did right away with the bombings and the ground assault, the uh, Hamas may have been in a worse position because they'd be receiving a lot less support. And people, like you said, when you attack an extremist group, that often leads to more support for that extremist group. And then Hamas doesn't have that momentum of the world going, oh, wait, like, what about the Gaza civilians? This is fucked up. This is fucked up. Right. So if you're an insurgent group, um, you realize that it's extraordinarily the uh, a disproportionate response by your adversary is really helpful for international public opinion. This is a war not only over territory or, or guns or financing, it's over public opinion, both of civilians on the ground and in the international community. So they realize that for every protest, pre-Palestine protest internationally, that buys them some political, political legitimacy, even if the people advocating for the end of the occupation are not pro-Hamas. Mm. Right. Um, it just it buys them legitimacy. Um, and this is what we've seen. Right. I think where a lot of the 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 political solution to the immediate crisis is going to happen behind closed doors. It's going to be private diplomacy between in Qatar, between Hamas and Israel. The Americans and Europeans are going to sit down and figure out how to negotiate a release of the hostages. Right. So you've seen the Israeli government agree to four hour ceasefires each afternoon. Um, one could imagine negotiation where there was a 24 hour pause and vi- humanitarian pause for every hostage that was that was released right that there could be a systematic de-escalation mm. based on the release of hostages um obviously the 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 um the optics of a ceasefire don't play well for the americans or the israelis so they've re they we've we have re um re- we've described that as a humanitarian pause i'm not sure what the distinction is in reality that's a political yeah. move right at the same time you have um, you have the hostage crisis ongoing, and you have an American support for Tel Aviv, where we're offering billions of dollars of security assistance, and we're not we're not conditioning this aid based on some basic preconditions that could de-escalate the conflict. Mm. Right? Giving the Israelis a blank check um, does not work in the U.S. national interest, and it doesn't make Israeli c- civilians any safer, let alone Palestinian civilians. Yeah. Do you think? The reason Hamas, or at least a big part of the reason why Hamas targeted so many Israeli civilians in the October 7th attack is to incite the biggest response possible from Israel, that that they wanted Israel to see red. And obviously, if you just attack military targets, that's that's also an act of war. But the response might not have been as uh, immediate and flattening without the civilian casualties. Do you think that's why Hamas targeted the civilians? Well, uh, terrorism is it's a political tactic, right? It's used to incite terror towards some political goal. Mm-hmm. And so like you, you're right to point out, targeting Israeli soldiers is an act of war. Targeting civilians is a war crime. It's a mm-hmm. war crime when Hamas does it, and it's a war crime when the Israelis target Palestinian civilians. Mm-hmm. Okay? So there's that distinction. The um, If you're trying to incite terror and fear and uncertainty, uncertainty those attacks, uh, targeting and victimizing civilians is extra- extraordinarily effective. At gaining attention, hmm. it it delegitimizes your cause, but that's also contingent on the response of of the the target state. If the Israeli government, they had a remarkable wellspring of goodwill in the first few days of the attacks, 
Yeah. Um, in response Absolutely. to that, I think uh, on the one hand, you can point that out is, uh, um, Israeli citizens will say, listen, the, the world's going to be anti-Israel regardless of what we do. We are targeting civilians. A- anytime we abide by the laws of role, it's not credit to us. They hold us to a higher standard than than the Americans were held to in Afghanistan or Iraq or NATO forces in Afghanistan. So the very fact that you're treating Is- Israel as exceptional is an act of anti-Semitism. Mm. That's kind of the, Zion- the Israeli Zionist critique is saying, listen, you hold us to a much higher standard than international humanitarian law. Even when we abide by that, there's critique. Yeah, absolutely. So we can't win. So we don't really need international. Why? Why should we as Israel care about international public opinion? You remember what international human uh, public opinion was in 1939. Yeah, no one wanted the Jews during the advent uh, during the, the immediate ap- uh, beginning of World War II. There's nowhere for us to go. We don't yeah. really need your international solidarity or support. Yeah, that that would be an Israeli narrative. Um, yeah, Th- this is. Uh, I have a two part question on the the intentions and the motivations behind a group like Hamas and and, uh, Jihad in general, which also part of it ties into your upcoming book, Surviving the Islamic State, which is June 2024. It's dropping. And we'll we'll get into to the thesis more of that book later. But this question uh, ties into it with the second part. But the, the first part of the question I have is, some people talk about Hamas like they're freedom fighters who go a little bit too far. That's sort of the characterization of Hamas. And then there's the other end of the spectrum where they're a complete jihadist death cult and we should take them at their word when they say that they want to commit jihad against the Jews in their 1988 charter. What do you believe is... Hamas's truest intentions when it comes to Israel? Yeah, very difficult question. I think um, the first part of that question is helpful, right? It's it's unsettling for many of us, particularly for Americans, to um, look at, it, at a, a radical Islamist group like Hamas or even Al-Qaeda and realize they are rational actors, that mm. there's a rational strategic outcome you can achieve by terrorizing civilians. I think our, our, our moral our moral intuition says no, this has to be irrational. That somehow this is a death cult or these are this is a suicidal ideology, there's nothing we can do to prevent it. There's a similar discourse to what we saw after 9-11. Well they hate us because of our American identity, our commitment to the uh, our our political principles. This is a uh, undeterrable political ideology fueled by violence and religious extremism. Um, and I think that 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 obscures the reality that there's a tactical logic, a rationale to terrorism that makes it very effective. Now, the fact that it's rational doesn't mean it's not evil. Something can be rational and evil at the same time. Mm. Okay, so I think it's it's fundamentally um, inaccurate to describe it as uh, an, uh, uh, an irrational ideological death cult with no no actual way of deterring them or any political, any political grievances that could be met. At the same time, uh, there's a, a serious political fault line within Palestinian politics about... Um, Palestinian liberation. Do you end the occupation through the Palestinian Authority and through democratic elections and 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 redrawing the map where you have territory, ending the settlements, the Israeli settlements in the West Bank or curtailing that, ensuring the right of return for Palestinians to return to the West Bank and Gaza? Mm. Or do you need to um, uh, um, defeat militarily the state of Israel? Mm. Right. I think that behind closed doors, if you talk to uh, Muslim Brotherhood throughout the region and Hamas in particular, especially the political leaders behind closed doors, they are well aware that they can't militarily defeat the state of Israel. Yeah. So the next thing is you try to delegitimate it, you try to weaken it, you try to take advantage of political polarization within Israeli society. Yeah. Um, the best thing you could do in response to that, if you're the Israeli government, is to re-engage the Palestinian Authority and say, listen, um, we're going to... Uh, re-engage on the issue of a one-state or two-state solution. The Palestinian Authority is the internationally recognized government of the Palestinian people. We need to marginalize and ostracize Hamas and the Jewish supremacists within the Netanyahu coalition. The problem is we're in the same position we were after the failure of Camp David. You have political extremists on both sides that, are, that have it in their immediate political interest to serve as a spoiler. Yeah. Yeah. If, if you asked me six months ago what I think motivates a jihadist group like Hamas, I would have said 100% religious extremism, that it, they're 
performing their godly duty of eliminating Jews and Westerners. And that is the motivation for 100% of the people all of the time in Hamas. And then I listened to conversations with people like Meg Smacker, who I don't know if you've seen the documentary uh, Jihad Rehab, where she goes into, I didn't actually see the documentary yet, but I heard her talk about it uh, on multiple podcasts. And she said something that stuck with me, which is, uh, I'm, and I'm sort of paraphrasing what she's she yeah. said, but she went into this jihad, jihad rehab in Saudi Arabia, which has you know, recovering jihadists from Guantanamo Bay. And she spoke to them face to face about what their motivations were. And one motivation was the, the, the causal duty, the religious duty, but a lot of other people became involved with jihad for money out of a sense of adventure. Um, you know, because their older brother did it and their dad did it and they, they just fell into it. And I wanted to read a quote from uh, surviving the Islamic, uh, surviving the Islamic State that go- that goes off of that um, sure. from your upcoming book. And so you write in the Israeli Defense Forces counterinsurgency campaign during the Second Intifada from 2000 to 2005. Palestinians selectively cooperated with multiple opposition groups such as Fatah, Hamas, and Islamic Jihad. In a study of 220 interviews with former Islamic State recruits, Ann Speckard and Molly Ellenberg uncovered a range of motivations for collaboration, including access to salaries or stipends, the desire to elevate social status, the need for sense of community, and the opportunity to work towards a shared mission. So I I wanted to ask you if you you could talk about some of the different motivations that people have to cooperate or join with uh, an extremist group like Hamas, uh, either from people you've spoken to personally in the Middle East or just from research for your upcoming book that, um, you know, you've acquired knowledge in general about that. Yeah, so I haven't done field work in, in, in Gaza or the West Bank on this particular question. Most of this comes out of my, my time in Iraq, where I, I've talked to lots of Iraqi civilians. I have colleagues that have debriefed hundreds of Islamic State fighters in American uh, uh, military prisons and also in Iraqi prisons. And uh, there's a variety of motivations, right? I think it's it's comforting on the one hand to say that, well, people are, are driven to extremism because they're homicidal maniacs. And that, in fact, is not the case. It's the, the radical minority of people join these groups because they're sociopaths, right? Mm. Um, when you think about it, the way I, I frame it is that, listen, if you're a civilian, you're in a community where you're confronting violence, either of government forces or rebels or insurgents, you have a couple different options. When insurgents come to town, you can collaborate, you can resist, or you can lay low, right? Very difficult to maintain neutrality. Most people keep their heads down. They try to hide, they try to relocate, they flee, right? If you have any motive or opportunity to safely flee, you do so. In the event mm. you can't, you hide or lay low. That's a temporary solution. At some point, you run out of food, money, work opportunities, et cetera. You have to go out in the community. In that part, it, when you reach that point, you have to decide, am I going to collaborate or resist? And most of us, right, confronted with that situation, there's everyday acts of resistance. There's soft support collaboration where we kind of feign support, but we act otherwise. Um, these are all just basic survival skills, survival rep- repertoires. Um, when it comes to collaboration, um, talked with some some folks and have drawn on my colleagues research about what how can you actually understand um iraqi's motivation for actively collaborating with isis you have to understand some pre-existing grievances right lots of sunni arabs in iraq worried about the maliki government basically the iraqi military and police forces being sectarian death squads targeting exploiting victimizing these communities especially if you're in western iraq which is primarily sunni arab um in parts of Kurdistan as well, but this is mostly that if you're equally afraid of the Iraqi military as you are of the Islamic State, then it's a balance of, okay, who's going to keep me safe? Who's going to govern my community effectively without exploiting me? Can I safely cooperate or support this group without undermining access to basic needs, food, mm-hmm. shelter, work, employment, and sacred values? Am I going to violate something fundamental about my identity by supporting you? Yeah. And a lot of times that was the case. This was a values-based decision to resist. I can't ISIS fighters are in my community. I need to. Res- I can't, in good conscience, do that. I can't flee. I need to stay and protect my property, protect my family and neighbors. Other times, collaboration, especially if you're a young man, 
your education, your high school or intermediary education is knocked off the rails by the war. You have no education prospects, very little employment or marriage prospects. That's a great uh, recipe or a set of ingredients for radicalization. Mm. Young, angry guys that don't have jobs, don't have access to sex or marriage or yeah. educational prospects. That's a great great set of grievances to motivate recruitment into violent groups. Yeah. It's like the terrorism is the incel outlet of the Middle East. You know, like it, you, you become right. a red pill YouTuber if you're an incel in America. And then if you're an incel in the Middle East, you're just like, I'm, you know, those guys over there shooting rockets look cool. Let me go see what they're up to. In part, right? So it's in part that Islamic State, it governed, it was a Islamist group that governed like a state. They established local offices to take out the trash and educate people and deliver the mail. And so lots of families would say we would get a monthly stipend, we get access to flour or or um, cooking gas for our, for, our, for our stoves in order to support. We'd have modest stipends of a few hundred dollars perhaps to cooperate. Uh, other yeah. times people were conscripted not only to fight but to serve in the civil administration of the Islamic State. So mm. it's like, am I actually collaborating if I like help deliver the mail? Like, I, I don't know. Like, yeah. am I morally capable? How culpable? How do I how do I interpret that? Right. Yeah. Very few people, when we when we interview them or survey them at length, say, I was fundamentally convinced of the ideological religious purity of this movement. I joined primarily because I'm a true believer. But there's just, in reality, very few people yeah. who are, are sociopaths, right? Yeah, I, I think you definitely have the, the uh, extremist mentality where you know you, you even have some people dropping out of medical school in london and then they go and join isis and because they came across extremist teachings and yeah that person is joining it for the utmost religious extremism of i'm fulfilling my duty i or else why would you leave a you know four hundred thousand dollar year job and like completely give up your life and then you have the other people who uh, are doing it for all the reasons that you've mentioned, whether it's family related or money related, a combination, wanting to get out of a certain situation, f- feeling uh, suppressed as an adolescent teenager, dealing with that. And, you know, you're, uh, you, you know, other people or other friends who have gotten involved in it. So I just feel like that was important to mention because I, I, uh, like I said, if you asked me three months ago, I would have said, everyone in all of these groups that we identify as terrorist organizations is joining it for one single specific reason. And there seem to be many reasons why people would join and carry out the things that they're doing. It's, it's not a justification right, right. for what they're doing, obviously, but the, 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 the conscription process and the, the joining process seems much more complicated than this person is, came across some radical teachings and now they've been brainwashed. It, it seems like there's, you know, thousands of different ways and combinations why people can be incentivized to join a group like that. Well, that's right. And you have to draw a distinction as well between foreign fighters and local resistance, right? So something unique to Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State is that they re- they attracted a fair amount of foreign recruits, people from the Western world or sub-Saharan Africa or elsewhere that wanted to fight and help build the caliphate. The reason why people mobilize and take the risks they do leaving the United States or London or Nairobi, Kenya, to go fight for ISIS is fundamentally different uh, than the motiva- motivation of, of, of local uh, locals in Iraq, Syria, Afghanistan for supporting the Taliban or ISIS or Al-Qaeda, right? Mm. Different set of motivations and constraints, um, primarily having to do with like local insecurity. If you're a foreign fighter, you're, you are forgoing, you're, you're voluntarily entering a very violent context because of some motivation either for marriage prospects, job, money, prestige, glory, meaning, whatever it is. If you're a local civilian living in a, in a conflict zone, you're already confronting severe strain on your basic needs, physical security, food, shelter, education, health care. Um, you're not voluntarily looking for um, uh, political violence or adventure, yeah. right? You're, you're, you're trapped in the middle of this. Have you, have you seen the pill thought experiment floating around the internet with, is, with the IDF versus Hamas? I haven't yet. Might you summarize it for me? So, so basically, the the thought experiment is: if the IDF and everyone in Israel took a pill that paralyzed them, and Hamas could have its way unimpeded, what would Hamas do to the Israelis? And then, vice versa, if Hamas and everyone in Palestine took the same pill, rendering them completely paralyzed and useless, what would the IDF do to the Palestinians? So, essentially, what would each side? Uh, 
do if they could do whatever they wanted to the other side. Unimpeded. Unimpeded, yeah. Do you do you have any thoughts on what you think the outcome could be in that sort of hypothetical? I mean, I think there's it, it depends on depends on the individual, right? Within um, Israeli society or Palestinian politics, there's at least four or five different perspectives on the ongoing crisis from people that may agree on on the fundamentals. Mm-hmm. Um, it's the question of do you take people at their word? So on the one hand. When you have members of Netanyahu's coalition talk about annexing the entire West Bank or ethnically cleansing Gaza and the West Bank, removing Palestinians, either through forced displacement or victimization, violent victimization, yeah. you take those people at their word. Yeah. On the other hand, we've seen that there are at least a thousand Hamas militants that are going to victimize, torture, and murder Israeli civilians. Yeah, those are the two extreme ends. Um, within the broader within the broader populace, I think there's a lot of um, there's despair and heartbreak and uncertainty about any political viable, viable political solution to the immediate crisis, let alone a longer term um, solution in, in Gaza and the West Bank. Like I said, the fundamentals are still there. It's the right of return. It's the expansion of settlements. It's where you draw the borders in places like East Jerusalem. It is um, Israeli need for secure secure borders. Yeah, um, and the and the breakdown. Or the, just even in the public discourse in the region outside of it, of the breakdown in the basic distinction between combatants and civilians is, mm. is really scary, right? Because this is what you saw with bin Laden back in prior to 9-11, where you have radicalist groups making the case because these victims are members of democracies, there's no moral or political distinction between a soldier and a civilian. All you mm. civilians are participating in the democratic process. You are morally and politically culpable for the crimes and sins of your government. Yeah. Right. So, but not, and that's some shoddy Islamic theology and politics, all the that, you know, of course, you know, but that, that's the, that's, that's part of the motivation for removing the line or removing the barrier between civilians and soldiers. At the same time, when you have IDF spokespeople calling Palestinians animals and failing to distinguish between Hamas militants and Palestinian civilians, this is where you get really, really the, the darkest parts of human nature come out. When you you have to fundamentally dehumanize your adversary, yeah. in order to wage violence. Yeah, I so, so I, I wanna I wanna shift the focus back to the humanitarian crisis in Gaza because you sure. you've spent you spent such a large part of your career studying how ordinary people survive tragic and and violent situations and sure. the you know saying that about Gaza would be an understatement right now because you have two million people. Right in the open air prison, no access to, or little to no access to food, fuel, medical supplies. What, what do you understand about the experience of civilians in Gaza that the average person who hasn't studied these types of situations may miss? What, what does the suffering look like for the, the people in Gaza right now? Well, I've only spent time in the West Bank, have not been to the Gaza Strip. I, I've been to Southern Israel. I think there is uh, an enormous amount of psychological stress. Just imagine if you're in a situation where it's every day going about your school work, taking your kids uh, out to the grocery store, when those things become inordinately difficult, there's just a basic latent stress or fear and uncertainty about your day-to-day routine. That is enormously traumatic over time, right? And so we have, we have firsthand accounts of Afghans and Pakistanis. We talk to Afghan and Pakistani civilians about the effects of having drones overhead. They're not particularly these these folks on the border of Afghan and Pakistan. They're not worried, in particular, about being targeted. But the psychological stress of just hearing the rotors of drones overhead, day in and day out. There's a team at Stanford that did some great studies on this. Just looking at the types of post traumatic stress that occurs on people. Oh yeah, are enormous. Even if you're not directly targeted, or even if you're not really worried about being uh, um, victimized or collateral damage to that attack, right? It's just we we fail to appreciate that because most of us don't live with that baseline level of stress during our day-to-day routine. Mm. Yeah. That, that's something I've been thinking about a lot actually recently is because c- you constantly see the emphasis on the body count and the images of violence, but there's not a lot of talk about how the millions of people in Gaza, they all have a brain that's being morphed psychologically by the things that they see going on around them. And what is that going to do? What, what does a person think and what does a person do when they 
uh, if you're a kid in that situation that survives when you become a young adult and you have decisions to make, what does that do to your psychology? What what sort of uh, options open up in your mind? What is it possible to lead a fulfilling life with all the trauma you've experienced, especially with little to no access to any sort of mental health care in that region? Like it, 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 it seems like there's just so much... Uh, like if you forgot about the the actual physicality of the masses of people in Gaza for a second, and you just had a hot spot on maps of psychological stress, it I feel like the area in Gaza would just be blown up red, one of the biggest spots on the global map right now, most concentrated spots, like as dark red as you could get if you had like this sort of stress map visualizing what was going on in different parts of the world. And it seems like the the morphology of the brain of groups of people during that and also the individual, the, the stresses that cause these changes that if you're young enough will, you know, last forever is an afterthought. Well, yeah, there's generational trauma and there's different effects based on your age cohort if you're an adolescent versus emerging adult or elderly. I think that's right. It's also, you know, some of us, uh, some of your listeners or of us may have experienced food insecurity. If you've grew up in a family or in, currently in a situation where you have uh, unreliable work or you're unsure month to month whether or not you, you have enough uh, money for groceries, that is that just introduces an enormous amount of stress um, mm. just in day to day stuff. Let alone if you're in Gaza, if you're in an apartment building, you know the Israeli Defense Force. I think in part to their credit, say we're very we do our best to discriminate between combatants and civilians. In fact, we do this thing called door knocking where we notify people in apartment buildings, we're going to strike this building in 10 minutes, you need to leave. So they mm. do through, they, they drop leaflets, they have sonar things, they can um, or, or, um, they can capture uh, cell phone bandwidth and send text messages to every phone in an immediate area. So even when you notify, um, that is uh, um, providing due notice, right? That undermines strategic surprise. But if you're a civilian, right, you're a Palestinian and you receive this note, there's still this question of credibility. Do I actually, am I actually going to be spared? Is this act, attack actually going to happen? If so, where do I go, right? So when you ask yourself, why don't people flee? You need to keep in mind that people only flee violence when they have motive and opportunity. You may have a motivation to leave. If you don't have the opportunity to safely exit, mm. what are you supposed to do? It's a function both of motive and opportunity. So even in the event that the Israeli Defense Force um, it does, the, does their, their best effort to notify civilians, protect civilians, there still is an enormous amount of trauma, uncertainty, and and victimization that happens inadvertently, given yeah. given these dense urban environments. It's 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 something maybe akin to the Iraqi army assault on Mosul in 2017, but it's even more even more um, pernicious. I mean, imagine if the Islamic State had decades and decades to build tunnels under Mosul or Fallujah or Ramadi, and basically entrench themselves for decades, preparing for mm. something like this. Yeah, yeah. So. <clears throat> Uh, Israel just announced, uh, I think it was two days ago, that they've taken complete control over Gaza City, and Netanyahu has plans to occupy Gaza indefinitely. What scenarios do you see playing out in Israel and Palestine over the next five months, five years down the line, and also the the region as a whole? Mm. Yeah, so excellent question, right? Um, and we uh, experts anticipated this before the assault, the ground assault began. The question is not, can you capture and hold territory, or can you even clear it of, of a militant group? Um, in some respects, that's the easy part. What do you do with the day after? Yeah. Right. So the Israeli military has experience military occupying Gaza. It did not go so well. Most members of the IDF uh, behind closed doors, they don't want to reoccupy Gaza. They don't want a, a military occupation in this area. Um, how do you do so in a way that actually you can prevent Hamas from operating or governing that doesn't destroy the ideology or the ability of them to actually uh, employ tax in the future, right? Um, there was uh, initial conversations in the last month about having an Arab Arab League force or having regional Arab states and peacekeepers in. None of the surrounding Arab states want to govern the Gaza Strip. Yeah. Right? The UN doesn't want to have peacekeeping force. The Arab neighbors don't want to. The IDF doesn't want to say the Americans aren't going to send soldiers on the streets of Gaza. And so the question of uh, what do you do and, and Netanyahu publicly uh, publicly announcing that we're going to indefinitely 
occupy this area. It is, it's this absurd and tragic uh, reality where the, the, the status quo is untenable, but it's unimaginable what will come uh, uh, beside that, what comes after that. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen s- some people suggest a handoff situation where you give Gaza to another Arab state like Egypt, and then Egypt just gives it back to Palestine. I don't know if yeah. that would be feasible do you think there's any plans to do that once israel or if israel deoccupies gaza or do you think they'll hold on to it for a while well i think ultimately pol- politically speaking they want to redeploy out of gaza i think in the immediate the immediate term what we see in, in egypt and certainly in qatar is really intense negotiation behind the scenes to locate and release the remaining hostages mm. um and so that's kind of the the proximate political point of negotiation before any secession of hostilities. Um, like I said, I think the status quo right now is that there's a four hour afternoon ceasefire to let in humanitarian trucks. Of course, that that gets you nowhere near the amount of necessary uh, fuel and water and basic uh, medical resources needed to, to care for a population, a million of whom are displaced. Yeah, and that, It comes out to something like an ounce of food or an ounce of water per person. I mean, there's logistically, you can't get that many semi trucks into an area when basic infrastructure has been destroyed. Huh. Yeah. So let's let, let me ask an impossible question, <laughs> or more impossible than than uh, we've been uh, talking about so far. So let's say a hundred years from now, in twenty one twenty three, we know there's going to be peace between Israel and Palestine. If you reverse engineer that peace what would it look like how what would be the path to uh that inevitable uh i I don't know if you've seen the the show on netflix bodies yet it has to time so yeah basically this isn't ruining any of the the story but it's basically like a time travel loop and you know it's going to happen ahead of time so like if we knew that there would be peace in 2023 that was part of the loop of the future what do you think Mm. the next hundred years would look like to get us to that peace yeah it's perhaps the most important question and also the the one most difficult to answer yeah Um, let's solve it here on the podcast (laughs) yeah next five minutes yeah (laughs) yeah we'll figure it out in the remaining time yeah um i could imagine a world in which a one state uh, one state solution is implemented. You have a confederation of, of Arab Palestinians and Jewish Israelis living under a single state. Um, in order for that to happen, you'd have um, united borders where you'd have Palestinians and Israelis living side by side, like they do in some Israeli communities like Lod or Nazareth. Mm-hmm. Um, you would have a fundamental transformation of Israeli politics where it would be um, um, no longer an ethnic democracy, but a liberal democracy. So it would be a state for Jews as opposed to a Jewish state, right? Uh, uh, the current status quo is that that is untenable. That's a mm. deal breaker that we want an ethnic democracy where Israeli citizens need to be ethnically and relig- or ethnically Jewish and, 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 and Arab Christians and internationals that live there will have uh, second class citizenship. That reality has to fundamentally change. Mm. We have to have a, a change to the DNA of ethnic democracy in Israel. I think you have a one-state solution. You have Palestinian um, the recitate the resuscitation of the Palestinian Authority. We have secular Palestinian leaders that are able to to come to terms um, um, with a, a one state as opposed to um, an independent state of Palestine, joint kind of confederacy, perhaps where it's organized at the provincial level, at the the, the district, the neighborhood level, yeah. some degree of, of regional sovereignty. Um, and that they can um, um, isolate and ostracize Islamist movements like Hamas. So you see, you have to see both the the extreme uh, Islamist wing and also the uh, the extreme right wing in Israel, where you have annexation and ethnic cleansing off the table. Right, right now we're on the precipice of really uh, significant political violence, and so we need political forces that can marginalize the extremes and reengage in the fundamentals. There's three or four fundamental political questions. That uh, in, during the Oslo process, we can same traction on that needs to come back on track. Though, like I said, currently it's a one state reality. So how do we go from a one state reality to a one state solution? Mm. 
I want to end off with your upcoming book, Surviving the Islamic State. I'm just going to run to sure. the bathroom real quick, and then I'll, I'll sure. be right back. Okay, we are back. Um, so, so your book, Surviving the Islamic State, comes out June 2024, where you explore how ordinary Iraqis survived wartime violence during the Islamic right. State occupation. What was the, the jumping off point for this project? What, what sort of drew you in this specific direction? Yeah, so that started, the project started seven years ago and I had to pick a dissertation topic. So the final hurdle of graduate school when you want to get a PhD is you have to pursue a multi-year project, either a series of papers, or in my case, a book project, making a contribution uh, to your field among a, a community mm -hmm. of experts. So I was in graduate school 2013 to 2019 as I was starting to come up with dissertation topics or ideas. That's when you saw the rise of the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria. And um, uh, did some did some grad research on that after graduate school the the book project transitioned to really a focus on civilian civilian mm. survival strategies how do ordinary people survive wartime violence and what did that look like in one particular case um so that's kind of the genesis of the project and it was picked up by columbia university press they'll come out this summer it'll be for pre-order here in the next month or two yeah and you, you mentioned in the the beginning of the podcast you travel to iraqi kurdistan right, right. and so you in the book you interview people from nine different communities who yeah. did who did you talk to exactly and what did you learn from speaking to the Iraqi people about the the violence that they endured and and how they survived it yeah so the the field work came out of Iraqi Kurdistan where I was um, made some uh, introductions received some introductions to Iraqis in the northern part of the country that lived around and outside of Mosul so northern Iraq is really interesting. It's historically this area of Nineveh, the Assyrian Empire, right? goes back far beyond the modern Iraqi state. And what you see there is really a whole series of ethnic and religious minorities. So you have Arabs and Kurds, Christians, Muslims, Yazidis, um, a lot of communities that were intensely persecuted by ISIS. And so I, the focus of those interviews in the last few years were with ethnic and religious minorities. How do people who um, face s significant threats, both from ISIS and the Iraqi government, how did they survive in these communities that have been there for thousands of years that are historically super important? These Christian communities in Iraq have been there since 200 AD, right? Mm -hmm. So really historically, culturally meaningful, but really on the wow. periphery of the state. And how did these people survive? Were there, were there any stories that stuck out to you specifically about hard choices that an Iraqi had to make? to survive because because you're talking to so many people on the ground was there anything that sort of blew you away or left you speechless when you heard about this a decision that someone had to make yeah um i write a, a bit in the book about just the reality of sexu sexual and gender-based violence so one of the really um, evil tragic realities of the islamic state's governance strategy was they had whole tiers of which women could be um, raped, trafficked, and victimized. So whether they were Muslims or non-Muslims, were they Christians? Do they have some protection because they are people of the book? They're Christians. They're not polytheists like Yazidis were, right? So they had this yeah. whole complex, really evil theology about who could be trafficked and raped. Um, and, and talking with women in, in these communities, you realize their difficult decisions about um, the reality of surviving by arranging marriages between local community members, women and girls, and ISIS fighters. Where this mm. was uh, um, this was described as an arranged marriage, which was a euphemism for um, um, human trafficking. Right, that these women were sexually exploited as a peace offering for local ISIS fighters, as a way to protect the wider community from violence mm. and victimization. And so there were a disproportionate or inordinate cost borne by women and girls as a way of of of, of survival for the greater community, um, in terms of. Um, particularly in situations where you could enter into an arranged marriage. A lot of, if you were a, a non-Muslim, non-Arab, you were um, sexually violated or trafficked. If you were a Christian or or, or a Sunni, Sunni Muslim woman or girl, there are opportunities for marriage. And, and, and in the aftermath of conflict, how do these women, how are they restored to their communities? How are they treated for post-traumatic stress and physical um, disability wrought by that? And how are they reintroduced to the community? And how did how did they uh, come to terms with what happened to them? How are these marriages the 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 theological reality of how do you how do you annul these marriages? Mm. How do you convince community members that these were forced marriages? 
that they were they were illegal and unethical according to Islamic law. Right. Yeah. That, that's some of the most heartbreaking reality of how people, the difficult trade offs you make to survive if you can't flee or, or protect yourself by fleeing violence. So the, the ISIS fighters would come into a community and the community would band together to try to figure out who to offer, which, which girl to offer as, as an appeasement to the ISIS fighter. And then they would kind of disguise that as an arranged marriage. That's sort of how it would work. It's, it depends on some of the community. So in a place like Mtel Afar in, in Nineveh, there are reports of local level negotiations between community elites and ISIS fighters that, that one of the ways to, um, to shield your community from further victimization, right? To not be exploited, you basically helped arrange Islamic marriages. Um, these outside of the, the, the radical theology of the Islamic state, these were neither legal nor Islamic legal according to secular law or Islamic law. But the, the idea was that you would arrange a marriage between local fighters and community members as a way to basically the spoils of war for local militants and a way to, to introduce some form of cohesion in the community to basically pacify local civilians. Um, I can't even imagine. It, it, yeah. That is like, I, I, I'm assuming that the, a lot of the girls that are given up to these ISIS fighters, they are having conversations with people in their family about it, like their mothers or siblings or, or, or neighbors even, and everyone knows it's going to happen. It, there, there's a buildup to this sort of thing. Like it, it's a, it's a, it's an active decision to give these, these women up so that there's like a, a period of, of discussing it with your family. Like I, I can't even imagine what that is like what that would do to someone to sort of be released into the chaos of an ISIS arranged marriage, but you know that you're also potentially saving people in your village. Like that, that is as dark as it gets. And that's a part of, uh, of the history of warfare and human nature that we've seen that in world war two as well. It's not, not unique to contemporary Iraq. Um, and, you know, the best accounts of this are not my book. You had a, a Yazidi woman that won the Nobel Peace Prize a number of years ago that has a, a, a Murad Yazidi who wrote a whole book on on her experience and advocating for for women and girls that survived this experience. And so listening to their stories and honoring that experience, it's a, it's a difficult line, right? You want to convey those things and honor their story. You also don't want trauma porn, right? Trauma yeah. porn can sell books, but it's, a, it's not a way to honor the dignity of people that went through that experience. Yeah. Yeah, I mean that that's uh I I feel like that's what you you've been able to do so well during this conversation is you're you're able to convey the violence and the the extreme situations that people are facing in Israel and Palestine without getting into the, you know, the pornish aspect of hanging over these like the extreme details because after a certain point it does get to the point it it does get to the level where you start to question why am i like i've seen it it's 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 bad people can go seek it out if they want to and i even succumb to that sometimes where i'm just like i'm watching videos and you sort of you watched one and so you're like all right well i've already watched one i'm gonna watch another and then you it, it it does become uh a, a difficult line to cross when you're when you're actually talking about it like how far is too far especially over a video or social media where, where there's some medium where you're separated from it it's not face to face or eyewitness rather like it's just it's poisonous for your soul right it's the gratuitous violence it is heartbreaking there's a way to experience the gravity of that without um just filling yourself with yeah. just gratuitous violence yeah what are what are some of the the most misunderstood aspects about the reality of surviving wartime violence? What what are what are some things that someone like me would probably assume is the state of things, but in reality, it, it's completely different when you're actually on the ground on the ground with these people. Well, people are incredibly resilient and creative, right? The human spirit is um, is pretty remarkable, and so I spend a lot of time just documenting the creative and subtle ways people resist. Uh, um, insurgents 
Uh, some yeah. places like Mosul, you had the dis- you had the distribution of compact discs. You'd flip the disc around, and you'd be able to mark insurgent checkpoints and, and safe houses because through the air, either through a drone or air- air- aircraft, you could see the reflection of a compact disc. So it was yeah. a subtle way to mark, to basically mark these targets for the coalition. Um, you had other people doing things as simple as during the the ISIS um, offensive on Mosul, going up to the roof of their apartment, playing music. Mm. Right, playing the violin, just the, the act of, of resistance through um, solidarity with the human spirit, um, and uh, lots of comical graffiti, and uh, ways to use humor and satire to undermine the Islamic State. So, like lots of clever wordplay. If you speak Arabic, um, even just the moniker we call the Islamic State, Dash Dash, uh, is a um, moniker for ISIS, but also sounds similar to like the word for donkey. Or yeah. calling the ISIS the they're not the Islamic State, they're the sex state. A whole bunch yeah. of guys that can't find sex a legitimate way, so they have to predate on innocent people. So it's a way to yeah. emasculate ISIS fighters through mm. just simple wordplay. Yeah. Stuff like that. Yeah, I, I'd be interested because I'm I'm such a huge fan of stand up comedy. I listen to podcasts, I try to go to as many live shows as possible. I would bet that some of the the people that have been through these just extreme horrific wartime situations have some of the darkest but also uplifting sense of humor because in order to survive something like that not just physically but psychologically it seems like you have to be able to make fun of it because like if you just sit with it it's going to destroy you I, I would be curious to interact with some of these people just to see like what do they joke about is anything off limits how how are they what are they laughing at and things like that yeah, there's an Iraqi guy that has a show called The Bashir Show. Uh, he'd be a great guy mm. to have on your podcast. He yeah. um, f- fled Iraq, uh, got some, was originally in Germany, got some funding from the German government to do a YouTube show, both in Arabic and now in English. And so he, he's, uh, it's a, that's a kind of a, a, a classic example of someone that survived the US, the US war and uses humor to kind of undermine radicalism. Of course, Bassem Youssef, the Egyptian surgeon turned comedian, the guy that was, He's friends with John Stewart, right? Boston mm. Yusuf, uh, he's now in LA. He's been a really powerful voice for human rights in Egypt. And even someone like Mo Amr and Mo Amr's stand-up special on Netflix. Yeah. He's a Palestinian guy. I grew up in Houston. He has this whole bit about how like Palestinian, like, he had to learn Spanish, right? Because he, he'd rather be misperceived as being uh, Hispanic than Arab. So he's yeah. like a <laughs> Palestinian kid that like learns Spanish. And he has this whole bit on like the difference between English and Arabic swear words and how Ar- English is like a por- pretty poor language to cuss in, you know? Yeah. So there's a lot of that. That's just um, yeah. evidence of, of, of the resilient spirit. You said the first one was called the Bashir Show? Bashir Show. Yeah. B-A-S-H-I-R or E-E-R. It's on YouTube. It's both in okay. and English. I'll, I think he's I'll based out, out of DC. He's US based. So yeah. he'd be a great guy to talk to. When it when it comes to uh, accounts of wartime survival, what, what did the existing accounts get wrong? When you're reading the things that are already out there, is are there just like these mainstream ideas held about surviving wartime violence that you've uncovered? The the evidence actually shows something in the complete opposite direction. Yeah, I mean, the conventional wisdom, I think, among scholars and, and also lay people was, well, you know, civilians collaborate or resist based on two logic. It's either pure opportunism. People are cost, they calculate costs and benefits. They act rationally and they they survive by maximizing benefits and minimizing costs. So there's the rationalist account on the one hand. The other is that all these conflicts are just permeated by ethnic hatred. So you're going to mm. support people that belong to the common end group, whether eth- you know, ethnic or religious, that Sunni Muslims are going to support ISIS because they're Sunnis. So both the ethnic end group support and the rationalist accounts miss just the fundamental realities of how, how people grapple with day-to-day survival and the, the types of calculations they have to make and who they perceive as being legitimate. Can local insurgent groups, can they provide for basic needs, basic yeah. goods and services without victimizing the community? Can they do so in a way that's preferable to the yeah. Iraqi to the Iraqi army, right? These are just kind of very pragmatic trade-offs that don't purely align with the rational choice account or the ethnic hatred account. Yeah. Yeah. That, and, and that's one of the, the through lines of, of the book is the, the repertoires. Yeah. And there's there's a quote I wanted to mention that you put in the book from Roger McGinty, who's also yeah. a, a professor of international politics. Yeah. And he said that repertoires express themselves in inconsistent, opportunistic, and messy ways. 
individuals react, create, ignore, forget, don't give a damn, conform, rebel, and do more often within the space of a day or an hour. And yeah, I, I feel like that that's something that people can easily forget. And, and, you know, at least that I would never think about during a wartime situation because I've never been in the middle of trying to survive wartime violence is that you're not always making rational decisions. You're not always connecting dots logically in ways that can be perceived from the outside of, oh, this was a black and white decision. And then of course they chose here and then they went here. It's not like A to B to C. There's all these creative decisions that people can make that that are a lot of them, they vary between communities and a lot of them are contradictory. Um, and, and you give examples of that and point it out in the book, but it was very eye opening just to see the, uh, the identification of those, uh, those uh, ways of operating using the, the repertoires. Cause I've never seen anyone talk about decision making like that before especially in wartime violence a lot of times you know the, the traditional way to frame that is strategies and maybe it's a simpler thing to pronounce or spell in a book but it it kind of struck me as too rational too logical too linear it didn't it kind of undermine just the complexity of human yeah human behavior so roger's book roger mcginty's everyday peace is a great example of that yeah yeah so <clears throat> when it when it comes to the the Palestinians surviving the the situation that they're currently in and and a lot of the the people in Gaza what what implications do you think that your your book and and the study have for Gazans surviving the violence based on what you found what what are some things that you think would lead to a better percentage uh a better chance of just surviving the conflict that they're in Right. That's a great question. It's a difficult one to answer. I have a couple ideas, I think, along that line. The first is when we talk about people being displaced or when people leave, um, you have to remember that it's a combination of motive and opportunity. The people that want to leave don't always have the opportunity. Sometimes you have an opportunity to safely exit. You don't have the motivation to because you just don't trust that um, you're going to stay safe while on the road as opposed to shelter in your apartment. And so one of the tragic realities we see right now is that even when people are the Israeli uh, military says, okay, everyone move south. We're going to enter Gaza City. Even when you have the ability to do that, assuming the roads aren't blocked or destroyed, uh, you're being displaced from your home. There's some chance you'll still be injured or, or, or killed. And um, if you're a Palestinian, the narrative or the perspective is, well, this is another catastrophe. We're, 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 we're experiencing the Gaza Nakba, mm. right? Because there's this really um, um, legitimate fear that if we leave, we're not going to be able to come back. My ancestors left their homes before we may be able to leave safely either to southern Gaza or through the Rafah crossing into the Sinai. We may be mm. able to go safely into Egypt, but we're never going to be able to return to our homes. Yeah. Right. That's the first thing in terms of people that, that flee. The people that stay, um, it, it, it's difficult to wrap your mind around or appreciate just the sheer desperation of people, particularly in these dense urban environments, facing real scarcity of basic needs. Of how they're gonna how they're gonna navigate um, survival when you have Israeli soldiers now entering urban urban areas, you have Hamas fighters, um, you have not only the ground incursion, you have the the aerial campaign. So how do you what what types of cost benefit analysis do you do to determine if you're safer in your apartment or not? Are you safer out in the open? Typically, that would be the case, but when infrastructure is destroyed or the southern checkpoint at Rafah is bombed, mm. you may not actually now be be no safer out in the yeah. open. And you can clearly be identified, let alone when you have uh, schools, mosques, churches, and hospitals, where they're by by design are civilians and fighters side by side. Yeah. Right. So it's just it's a difficult, difficult reality, even for Israeli soldiers that want to draw those distinctions, targeting combatants instead of civilians. Um, you're not going to have combatants uh, dressed in military fatigues, right? That's going to undermine their ability to counteract mm. Israeli military. So. Um, yeah, that's that's such a mind fuck that you could be safer out in the open in a place like Gaza. Yeah. It seems so counterintuitive that you'd want to be inside a building, inside an infrastructure, but when forty percent of the the buildings get flattened, you're you're exactly right. It's like what are your chances of survival? Maybe being outside may actually be better than being inside a building. 
Yeah, and so this this idea of remaining, uh, the ability to remain autonomous or neutral or hide or lay low, that's an, our initial impulse. Most of us in those situations, that's would be what we pivot to first. It's just not sustainable. And yeah. It's not a sustainable survival strategy in the long run. Yeah. yeah. So we we mentioned uh, the Osama bin Laden TikTok thing very briefly <laughs> yeah. in the beginning of the conversation, and I made a note to to come back to it. But first, before we end off, I, I want you to tell people where they can follow you and keep up with you because your book is coming out in June 2024. And you also have a lot of great research on your website and links to other work that you've done. So what's the best place for people to keep up with you? Yeah, I appreciate that. My website is just my name. It's austinnuppy.com. And that's where I have uh, teaching resources, public appearances and research. I'm on Twitter as well, though I'm to, to more and more tempted to pivot away from that to something more uh, edifying. Uh, yeah. The book will be available on Amazon and any other bookseller. It's with Columbia University Press. It's coming out in May or June. It'll be out on Kindle, paperback, hardback at the same time. Great. Yeah. So, so with the uh, the Osama bin Laden TikTok situation, which I just saw probably 30 minutes before I, I started yeah. to set up for the podcast. So basically what's going on for people that are not aware, the letter to America that bin Laden wrote to America, of course, resurfaced on TikTok. And I believe this was published back in 2002. Uh, was this before or after 9-11 did he write this letter? Um, I want to say it's before 9-11, but I'd have to check. He has something like four or five public statements it, it, or media okay. media appearances where he tells the American people, here are my, here are my five grievances. Let me spell okay. them out for you. Got it. I'd so have to I, check the date on it. So I saw the, the 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 letter to America was at least published in The Guardian in 2002. I'm not sure when yeah. Bin Laden put it out there right. to the American people. But it's resurfaced on TikTok and, and Twitter, Instagram, wherever you know people are releasing short form videos. And people are reacting and reacting to the letter in a way that is extremely empathetic to bin laden and pointing to uh the grievances that bin laden has with america and and connecting that to uh you know having empathy for a figure like bin laden so i wanted to ask you what what is it what does it say about the state of our culture that we are actively empathizing with Osama bin Laden. I think it's historic, it's naivete <laughs> and historical ignorance. Uh, like I said, most of my students now, if they're first or second years at university, they're born after nine 11. So they come across as they, they know none of the context. It's like, Oh, these arguments make sense, right? They're looking in the rear view mirror at the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, the war on terror and saying, well, these, you know, grievances were legitimate. I think, you can look at Bin Laden's set of grievances. You can understand them without having to agree with them yeah. or empathize with them. Yeah. And uh, that was true even at the time. There were analysts at the FBI and CIA saying, listen, we know what Al-Qaeda's core grievances are. We may not want to accommodate or appease those. There may be real reasons not to. But um, if we, if we are, are antagonizing violent Islamist groups, should that give us pause to reconsider our support for Arab dictators? Yeah. Or reevaluate the ways in which the U.S. supports the Israeli government? Or yeah. is it in our strategic interest uh, interest to maintain a permanent military presence in Saudi Arabia? Maybe it is, maybe it's not, but we, we didn't have that debate. Yeah. Right. And so those are just a handful of them. Um, and you can, you can realize the, uh, the strategic logic of that without emphasizing with bin Laden or Al Qaeda. Um, and you can appreciate the moral nuance of combatants and civilians without buying into bin Laden's argument that there's no such thing as a distinction between soldiers and civilians. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, th there are there are plenty of Americans that have grievances with America, and, and sure. I I share those grievances with you know. Th th there's a list of things that you can go down, and, and Bin Laden happens to address uh, a lot of the things on the list that America has done. But anyone can do that, and a lot and a lot of people do do that, and then it's completely different to take those grievances and then fly planes into a building and, and kill 3000 people. There, there are other, uh, there, there are other people that I would like bin Laden is, is 
2 billion on a list of people that have grievances with America that I would empathize with. <laughs> like I, you'd be like the absolute last person on the list. Like there, there are plenty of people that have grievances with America that are worth empathizing with. And bin Laden is, is not one of them. I'm just imagining like oh, a, a Gen Z podcast that has bin Laden on a get as a guest, if he were still alive, just like being like, yeah, like, you know, tell your side of the story. You know, people always talk shit about you, but like, we're going to tell the other side of Osama bin Laden and just like red table talk with Jada Pinkett Smith and Osama yeah. bin Laden. Like <laughs> that's like what it, it feels like it's come to, but it, I don't know. Well, and we failure, there's a cynicism there, but also just profound naivete. That yeah. We failed to appreciate that they may be drawing on that in order to persuade or confuse people. So do you think like, you know, all these, uh, the Islamic State's a great example. I had online video and podcasts and, magazines were in English, they would talk about race riots and Michael Brown and Ferguson and all these things. Do yeah. you think they're using that instrumentally? Yeah. Like like they may actually 100%. not care at all about about police and justice in the United States. Maybe they're using that as a way to undermine confidence in the rule of law. Okay, fine. Like you said, there's plenty of other sorts of agreements that are reliable that you can work towards that. Yeah. Um and so that's just kind of the bizarre social media age in which we're in. Yeah. Do you do you feel confident about the future? I, I feel like I have to ask you because you are just professionally, you're you're paying attention to a lot of the most horrific situations on the planet and you've traveled to places that have had a deep history of violence. And it, it seems like, you, you know, you there's no other way to do your job without being constantly bombarded by violent situations. Does that make you cynical about the future? Do you feel confident about human kind's ability to move forward with a, you know a less vengeance in our heart make a more fulfilling state of living what what are your what are your feelings on the next five ten hundred years without you know the future loop to tell us this is what's going to happen like what, what do you what do you think is going to be happening going forward i mean that's that's a that's a perfect note to end on i think um you know there's a very delicate balance i i told this to my students there's a very delicate balance between hope and despair. And a lot of us are maybe on the knife's edge between those two, right? Either because of biochemical reasons or life experience or variety of things make it difficult to navigate that, right? And so in my work, um, my personal relationships with Muslims and Christians and Jews in the Middle East and my students here at Utah State University give me hope uh, for the future. People that are, that are doing their best uh, to survive really bad situations they're uh, attempting to love God and love their neighbors themselves amidst extraordinarily difficult um, circumstances. And my engagement, not only with my American students here in Utah, but also students and, and colleagues in Iraq and Jordan and Lebanon and Israel and in the West Bank, um, Yemen, give me give me hope. And, and that's about the best I can do is educate them, support them, do research that, that respects their their inherent human dignity and do so in a way that that, that um, is hopeful rather than, than prone to despair. But like I said, a lot of times we're just sitting on a knife's edge between yeah. those two. Well, Austin Nuppy, thank you so much for, for coming on the podcast. If, if you're a podcast host listening to this or watching this, please have Austin on because there are not enough podcasts with you on it. And you, you've, you've have such, uh, it seems like you've, you've, you've been to so many, uh, interesting places that are that are part of the political conversations going on today and you do such interesting work and i would love to to hear more conversations with you out there so thank you so much again for for coming on the podcast and it, it's been an absolute blast that, that three hours flew by I, I looked down at like a hour and 20 and then i went to go take a bathroom break i was like holy shit it's two hours and 30 <laughs> minutes so that, that's always an indicator of a a good conversation and I, i'm sure people will gain a lot of value from from what you've said thanks zach appreciate it. it's great to have these conversations it's one of the favorite parts of the job to talk yep. ideas with someone appreciate your time thanks austin